Good evening. I call the uh, the meeting uh, a public hearing meeting for today, July third, two thousand and seventeen. June if you could just June. please rise. June third, two thousand and nineteen. I don't know why I keep doing this. Please <laughs> rise and salute the American flag. Really? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeah, I got to get my date squared away. I don't know exactly what's going on. Maybe I want to go back in time. The problem is that I was at Brockton High School for the graduation. I saw all those young people. I think I was thinking of going back to the high school. That's probably what it was. <laughs> but this is a, a, a public hearing that we are required to have. So we're having it. And if there are any folks uh, in the audience who are interested in coming forward and saying um, their piece, there's a sign-in sheet at the podium. Uh, please come up and... Uh, Introduce yourselves to the clerk uh, with your name and address. It's open. Good evening, everyone. Jean Holm, 65 Belt Giraffe. Oh, there's someone down here ahead of me, but did I cut off a Dennis Hersey? Oh, you sure? So, and I apologize, I'm a little out of breath, I just ran up the stairs because I thought this was me when starting at six. Um, so I'm gonna start by saying that I'm, I appreciate um, Council President that you're having this hearing. Um, I'm a little disappointed, however, um, because as you know, uh, I attempted to obtain a copy of the budget proposals. Um, I had many communications and still have never seen that budget proposal. It is a document, it is a public document. And I do think that if you're gonna have a hearing and invite residents to come and speak, that one of the first steps would be that the document that we're being asked to speak about is available to us. And it does seem to me that that could easily be available on the city website. I noticed that they published uh, a list of the departments and they reference page numbers, but they don't provide the pages that correspond to that. So at this point, it's a little difficult for myself or any resident to quite frankly speak to any of the budget requests because we are kept in the dark and we have no idea what they are. So I'm gonna suggest going forward because it can't be corrected tonight, but maybe it can. I have an idea that just came to me. I'm gonna suggest that what you do is, is that you present the proposals over the course of the next two days, and at the end, once you have publicly discussed the items that were denied by way of written documentation, that you actually have another public hearing available to the residents who can actually then speak about the proposals that are being made by the various departments and can speak intelligently. Now, I don't know as though it's intended for us to not be able to speak in intelligently about the proposals or not, but that is what I would recommend, and I would recommend, again, going forward in future years. If the budget cannot be put on the public website and made available to the public in a sufficient amount of time in advance of the public hearing, then I would recommend that you always hold the public hearings at the end after the discussions have been had. Because at least then, even though the residents can't read the documents, they can at least have heard the substance of them. So that is a recommendation and suggestion. My only other comment, which I can't, again, speak specifically to individual items, is that I urge you, as the City Council, to proceed cautiously and prudently when you are considering this budget. As you well know, last year, cuts were made, but clearly not enough, because as we know, the way that it works is, is that this budget is held 
The mayor submits his budget. You all get to look at it. You can make cuts, but you can't add. But at the end of the day, this particular action that you take here now affects us taxpayers down the road in December with taxes. So I know we're not here to talk about taxes, but I do have to say, because of the budget that was passed last year, and I recognize you all made cuts, but you just didn't do enough. Because when it came time to answer to the budget that was set by you all, us as residents, particularly senior citizens like myself, received enormous increases in our bills. And the same is going to happen again, because what happens when the taxes are set is, is that whatever you set as the benchmark of this is how much the city needs to raise, that's how much the tax revenue has to be at the end of the day. And how that gets there is on the backs of the taxpayers, either through increased assessments or increased tax rates or both. So I ask you respectfully to cut Cut, cut, and cut. Cut this budget to the bone. Cut more than you did last year. And I strongly urge you to reduce this budget down to what the budget was two years ago. That may give the taxpayers relief down the road in December. It may not. It may not be enough. But at least it's a fighting chance that we have as taxpayers, and particularly as senior citizens. So I make that request to you because I can't speak to individual items because I don't have them. And again, I urge you to consider having a second public hearing to allow people to speak to the individual items that ultimately are put forth at the hearings that's going to take place later tonight as well as over the course of the next day or two. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else to speak at the... <laughs> Please come forward and give your name to the clerk, as well as your address. Dennis Hersey, homeowner taxpayer, 7 Kenwood Street, Brockton. I've, I've had about a thousand issues, but I'm only going to dwell on two tonight. Thank you for having me, City Council, and thank you for the people who came tonight, because it's very important in the next several days. We have some critical, critical needs in the city of Brockton. However, certain people have priority. Now, I want to say this to you. We need police officers desperately, not just a little bit, but desperately. We have a city of 100,000 people, probably 110, 115 after the next census. We're down to 190 police officers, I believe. We are about 30 police officers short. I hear people always say uh, our police don't respond. If you saw the backlog some nights, especially on that 4 p.m. to 12 midnight shift, they can't get to it. They can't get to all the calls. And that's because there's just not a, enough police officers on duty. Now, recently, Bob May wants to build, and he wants all this money to build a police and fire station. And yes, we do need one, no question. But the timing is wrong, and the timing is bad. First and foremost, we need police officers. We've just been... We, how do I say this to you? We just have been responding to the retirements and the resignations. Last year, you raised some patrolmen to sergeants. You took them off the street. Okay? You, we need more police, and that's the bottom line. We really, really need police in the city, and that should be our number one priority right now. Now, some people are going to say the schools. That should be number two. But the schools, remember this. We get 80% refunded. We build a new school, which I think is great. We need roads. Yes, we do. But I'm telling you, our number one right now responsibility is to protect the citizens and law enforcement. Now, that money Bob May wants to build a police and fire station with, he withheld a lot of information from you people. And some of you voted, to, you took the bait and voted for it in the beginning. But when you found out how much it really was, Everybody here made a compromise, which was good. But you still have $693,000 that you can put towards police. And that's where that money should go. It's not that we don't need a new police and fire station. Right now, we need police officers on the streets. We really do. 
The second issue I, I want to speak about tonight is how in the heck did the Brockton Rocks open up without paying their bills? Now, everybody out here has to pay their water, their sewerage, their electricity, including me. And if we didn't pay it, it would be shut off. Yet the Rocks owe the city money and they're, w they're wide open. I don't know if the city council, I don't know if it's your responsibility to say yes, you can open up or no, or if it was the mayor's. But the people need to know who made that decision. You can open up without paying your bills. It's not fair. It's really not fair to the taxpayers to do that. It's not. They should pay their bills and they should pay their bills before they open up. The other issue on that is this. That league isn't gonna go. It's a dream. Let's face reality. The baseball league that goes is on Cape Cod. That's all the Division I scholarship athletes. The NCAA finances that. That's what people go and watch. They don't follow this team here with the Division Three athletes, the non-scholarship athletes. They don't. And that's, we're wasting money in that stadium right now. We should be having major, major events there. And I'm talking about major events, all right? Concerts, boxing matches, wrestling matches. That's what we should be having there. Big ballroom dances under the stars. We've got a stadium we're not using properly. We're really not using it properly. But the bottom line here too is they opened up without paying their bills. I'd like to know who gave the permission for them to do that. I don't know if it's the city council. I don't know if it was the mayor, but somebody really made a boo-boo in doing that, and it's not fair to us. I if they're gonna be exempt from paying their water, their surge, electricity, then all of us here should be exempt from it too. And that's the only fair way. I said enough, I might come back another night. I know some people here don't wanna hear me talk, but I'm talking truth and fact right now. The number one priority, the number one concern of the city should be firemen, policemen. We are in desperate, desperate need of more law enforcement in this city. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, is anyone else here to speak on the budget in the public hearing? Is anyone else? No? Third and final. Anyone here? Third and final call for the public hearing on the budget. <coughs> hearing none. I will close the public hearing and take a three minute recess and then we'll go right into the budget. Okay. Well, I would like to go up. Sure. And, and it's now on. <laughs> Time having arrived, I call the meeting of this finance committee to order for today, June 3rd, 2019, it's now 6.35. And we're here for the purpose of dealing with the budget for the FY 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor mm -hmm. Powell, you wanted yeah, to? Just, just one request to you and to the mayor, uh, given the remarks that were just made uh, during the budget hearing. Could both of you see if perhaps a couple of copies of these could be dropped off at the public library? And then if someone's interested, they can go in and take a look at it. I think it would be too much to try to put on the website and scroll through it on a laptop or a monitor, and not everyone has computer access. But I do think it would be appropriate to make a couple of copies available at the library in case people want to take a look at it. Not to be taken out, but to view on premises. Sounds like a fair asking. I will work with the mayor, and I'm sure we will be able to uh, to have a, a couple copies uh, placed down there. Uh, Councilors, we're going to dive right into the budget, but I just wanted to make sure that we stay on topic. It's a it's a long process, and it's a long budget. Uh, I think we need to ask the relevant questions. But if questions have been asked, I think we should kind of move on to additional questions so we can get all our questions answered, and that the public doesn't. Uh, become a little on the irated side in dealing with us. That being said, Madam Clerk, if you could Mayor's call Depart the first. Mayor's Department, Honorable Bill Carpenter, Mayor. Mr. Mayor, welcome. Good evening, Mr. President, Councilors. <clears throat> 
First, if I could, Mr. President, just quickly in response to Councillor Farwell. Councillor, it did go up on the website today. So the, it is on the website and available today. Thank uh, you. We thought in deference to the council, we shouldn't be putting it out prior to the council beginning the hearings. Um, if I could, uh, Mr. President, I'd like to give an opening statement, sure. uh, an overarching view of the entire budget, and then I will remain for any specific questions you may have on the mayor's office budget. <clears throat> and I'm fighting my allergies, so please bear with me. Uh, Mr. President and members of the Brockton City Council, it's my honor as the mayor of the City of Champions to present to you the fiscal year 2020 budget, my sixth as your mayor. It's my duty to present this spending plan to you, but it's my pleasure to discuss the progress we have made and are making together. Therefore, in accordance with the general laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the ordinances of the City of Brockton, I hereby recommend that the City Council adopt the fiscal year 2020 budget for the City in the amounts and form as recommended in the budget order previously submitted to you. I have recommended appropriations in the amount of $450,712,073. This amount includes our general operating budget, our five enterprise funds, and the fulfillment of our obligations to the Commonwealth and the County. I'm going to use for purposes some slides up here on the screen just to help, uh, help me illustrate uh, some of the things I'm talking about. We'll go to the first slide. Yep. As you can see from the slide up on the screen, our commitment to public education continues to comprise nearly half of our total spending. In fact, since taking office, I'm proud to note that we have committed more than $6.3 million over required school spending to the students, I'm sorry, 9.3, 9 maybe I should use my glasses. We've committed more than $9.3 million over required school spending to the students and families of the Brockton Public Schools. There are many important components of this budget that I would like to highlight for you. First and foremost, and as demonstrated graphically for you right now, this budget maintains our unwavering commitment to funding public education despite continued challenges in the Commonwealth's funding formula. Although Chapter 70 funding has significantly increased in both the Governor's and the House budgets, the increased cost of charter school sending tuitions significantly hampers that process, that progress. As you can see, these deductions have risen again by nearly $3 million for 2020. That's up $3 million from last year. Bringing the aggregate required spending to more than $18 million per year, severely hampering our ability to dedicate adequate funding to our own classrooms. This budget, however, continues to make a commitment above the required spending levels, helping to achieve a milestone of no proposed layoffs for the first time in five years. And let me just repeat that, no proposed layoffs for the first time in five years. That is an accomplishment based on the ongoing collaboration between my office, our finance team, the superintendent's office, and her finance team. And speaking of the superintendent, we wish Superintendent Kathy Smith all the best as she moves on after an extraordinary tenure here in the city of Brockton. And at the same time, we look forward to working closely with interim superintendent Mike Thomas to continue our commitment to the young people of this city. Our commitment to public safety is also sustained in this budget, maintaining our staffing levels in the police department after significant increases, a total of 28 new officers over the last five years. This year, our budget proposal also includes the addition of seven new firefighters, bringing the department closer to its full complement of 213. In addition, this year's capital budget will propose the replacement of two of our aging pumper engines, helping to modernize our first response fleet with the principal and interest paid from ambulance receipts. 
minimizing the impact on taxpayers and instead using revenue from our contract with Brewster Ambulance to support this vital purchase. As you can see from this slide, our public safety spending represents more than three quarters of our total personal services spending for the city. And as you know, this commitment is producing results. Our crime statistics continue to demonstrate that this pledge of a better Brockton that we have made together is making our city a safer, a safer and better place to live. In fact, since 2014, we have put more boots on the ground, hiring 39 new police officers in a real and tangible demonstration of that pledge. And we're not done yet. We currently have 17 cadets entering three different police academies. This budget makes a commitment also to invest in our aging infrastructure, including the commencement of a robust plan to replace water mains and continues our ongoing commitment to supplement the state aid, Chapter 90, with an additional appropriation to pave and repair our city streets. Our FY 2020 public properties budget includes an amount to begin to design and renovate office space located at the county-owned property at 32 Belmont Street for purposes of moving our regulatory departments, planning, Board of Health, and building pro public properties to this downtown location, providing convenient one-stop shopping for citizens and developers using these critical departments. This initiative will also relieve some severe overcrowding in City Hall, where some departments have personnel dispersed in different offices, and will also allow for the school department to expand the Parent Information Center at the Paul Studensky Building, improving services to the families of our students. This budget includes a required increase of approximately $2 million for our contribution for our contributory retirement program through the Brockton Retirement Board. This necessary and required increase, which is prescribed by a formula provided by the Commonwealth, is on the heels of last year's increase of more than $5 million. So our, our cost of pension contributions between last year and this year is up $7 million, committing a significant portion of our available revenues for these fixed costs. Councilors, we have long debated and discussed the status, the funding, and the future of the Brockton 21st Century Corporation, B21. I've heard your concerns and I've listened. The FY 2020 budget does not provide any direct funding to this agency. The funding previously dedicated to B21 is now shifted under the city's administrative umbrella by funding maintenance of the stadium and conference center within the public property department and funding a new business development planner in the planning and economic development department, bringing the coordination and business development activities of B21 back within the city's control. The planning budget also includes funds for a collaborative effort with the Brockton Redevelopment Authority for the reestablishment of the position of Main Street Manager, continuing our ongoing efforts to form partnerships with our downtown entrepreneurs and seeking new collaboration with future business owners joining us in our revival. This budget also funds a number of capital requests through various sources of funding that minimize the impacts on Brockton taxpayers. We will continue our discussions with you on capital planning and are working on a five-year capital plan that will not only provide the ability for long-range fiscal planning, it will give us the ability to begin to plan adequately. It will give us the ability to begin to plan adequately for major capital initiatives like the new public safety buildings and a fully renovated and updated Brockton High School. Each decision we make is with the interest of the taxpayers in mind. All of our initiatives and all of our progress is able to be accomplished while maintaining our practice of very conservatively 
estimating revenues, and maintaining vigilance related to overall spending. Our CFO is available to discuss the particulars of our revenue assumptions with you in greater detail. I look forward to reviewing this proposed spending plan with all of you. A municipal budget is the most important policy statement of a community. It conveys the values of a community. It tells the public what is important to its decision makers. Together, we can send a clear message that the education and protection of our citizens is paramount in the city of Brockton. As an overarching theme, the continued pressures of uncertain state aid and education funding will continue to place a burden on funding our municipal operations through solely property taxes, local receipts, and enterprise fund revenues. We will continue to consider all options, including legal action, in obtaining a formula to more fairly reimburse the costs to educate our students. I look forward to working collaboratively with all of you to focus on solutions to this vexing challenge. So onward we go together. And that concludes my opening remarks, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Do you, um, do you want to just dive yep. in right into your, uh, sure. your department? I was asked to bring a mission statement, Mr. President. Th I did. I, okay. asked, I asked that of every single one of the departments because I think it's only fair to the, uh, the residents and the taxpayers of this community to know exactly what these departments uh, do for them and who the individuals that run those departments are. So the and I believe yours. all our department heads will be prepared to provide you with that. Thank you, sir. The City of Brockton Mayor's Office is responsible for the coordination and oversight of all city offices and activities. The Mayor is chiefly responsible for the safety and protection of all residents, and per City Charter, the Mayor is the Chief Executive Officer of the City and is responsible for all city agencies. The Mayor's Office is committed to carrying out these duties in a fair and inclusive way that celebrates and embraces Brockton's vibrant diversity and storied history. As head of city government, the mayor also plays an important role in uniting its citizens and bringing together the tiles of Brockton's rich and shining mosaic. With that, I'm available to answer any questions regarding the mayor's office budget. I'm now going to go to my glasses because the typing in here is a lot smaller. Councilors, that portion is open. Uh, do we have any takers? Any questions for the mayor? Uh, Councilor Sullivan. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Good evening, Councilor Sullivan. Uh, thank you for that synopsis and the summary. Um, I just had a couple of questions, and I'm probably similar to some of the questions I've asked you in prior years, but mm -hmm. um, I know that the council president, and I've had conversations with him relative to the tourism, and I do want to applaud you, Mr. Mayor, relative to B21, so thank you for doing what you did on that and listening to uh, the wishes of the council. But in terms of the department request for tourism, which was a little, uh, a little above 47 grand, 47,433, and then the, the recommendation was 76,647. I'm just trying to get a justification relative to that. And, and if you could explain to us and those here in attendance and those watching on TV, Mr. Mayor, um, how you envision that money to be actually utilized for tourism. Because over the years, it hasn't been done properly by prior administrations as well. Well, I think that under tourism, and there was a little bit longer title for it, we included efforts to promote the city and pr pr pre present the city in a favorable light, encouraging not just tourism, but in encouraging business investment and families to move to the city. Specifically this year, uh, I know that there was significant expenditure for a downtown business guide that will be coming out. We thought it was important uh, that with the uh, resurgence of the downtown, that there'd be a good uh, guide to folks that may be considering coming to Brockton as to what's going on in the downtown. Uh, we're also working on a restaurant guide. Um, and the restaurant guide, again, I think there's been an agreement that we need to help bolster and increase the number of restaurants here in the city. And the idea behind it would be to provide a guide to anyone 
who's perhaps thinking about dining in the city of Brockton this evening or this weekend to have a handy reference to see all the various types of restaurants that we have available. Mr. Mayor, are you doing that in-house or are you having a consultant assist on that endeavor? It was subcontracted out. Subcontracted yep. out. So to, to, to an outfit that specializes in those things. So has done them for other cities as well. And w so that 76 grand will, will, will cover all those endeavors? Yes. Okay. Um, just a few other questions. Relative to um, the capital project, it was, it was requested at 60,000. This is under the mayor capital um, outlay. Um, and then it came back at zero. I'm just trying to get a, some uh, clarification relative to that endeavor as well. It's um, one. Yep, I got it now. Third one down. Sixty thousand on oh oh one. Yep. I'm gonna have to consult with the CFO on that one, Councilor, if it's Mayor. okay. Claxon, good evening. Good evening, Mr. President, Councilors, Council Sullivan. Much of the capital planning, and I'm happy to discuss capital planning in general, uh, we have deferred from this budget. There's a, an ordinance that we included in the budget packet that actually suggests that the chief financial officer working with the mayor and the council put together a capital plan on an annual basis. So you'll see many of the capital requests actually deferred for us to put uh, together this summer a capital plan that we will submit to you in total. So some of the capital items are included in the budget, others are deferred to be part of that capital plan. Thank you, Mr. Clarkson. Mr. President, I just, I, I just had two questions for the mayor that I believe are on point, if, if could get some indulgence from you. You got um, the mic, sir. During the public hearing, I don't know, Mr. Mayor, if you were able to, to hear the conversation, but one of the residents had inquired relative to how the Brockton Rocks could have opened the season with having outstanding uh, uh, bills. Um, and, and again, as elected officials, you included, and some school committee members are here as well, um, we just have to have the answers. So again, it wasn't the council, Mr. No, Hersey, it wasn't I, the council that agreed to that. So if you could just enlighten us on that, Mr. Mayor. Sure. So we inherited the Brockton Rocks had a lease with the Brockton 21st Century Corp. When we assumed the asset at the first of the year, we also assumed all the agreements that came with it. Um, the advice of legal counsel was that they had a valid lease that did not have any terms in it that would allow the city to try to void the lease based upon an unpaid bill. Um, I am no more pleased with the situation with the team than many counselors are, um, but unfortunately have to follow the guidance of, of the attorneys uh, who advised me that they had a valid lease and could open for business. Thank you for clarifying that, Mr. Mayor. And my, and my last, and, I, and you and I have had conversations about this, and um, the Little Red Schoolhouse, in terms of uh, a collaborative approach with your office, the body here, and the school committee, and historic commission, or whatever, could, could you just give us maybe a quick synopsis on that sure. as well? So in, we've been working with uh, Mr. Kasseri on that, and he can, I'm sure, fill you in more detail when he appears in front of you. Uh, but the, the guidance from Mr. Kasseri is because it is a historical building uh, that we have to, before we can even touch it, go out and get a historical, a certified historical architect to approve and design any repairs in, uh, to the building. And it's a significant expense. Um, it, so this isn't, this isn't a decision to just go over and nail up a couple of clad boards and slap a coat of paint on it. Uh, it's going to require a significant investment. Um, but I do agree with you that it's important to preserve that and we're willing to work with the council to establish a budget to make that happen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Council. Council Farwell. 
Mr. Mayor, uh, evening, your Council. budget is pretty straightforward, but I would like to pick up on a couple of uh, issues that mm -hmm. uh, Councillor Sullivan raised. What, when we took over the, the lease, if you will, for the stadium and the conference center, my understanding is there were certain lease payments that are, were to be made to the corporation. I'm assuming they will now come into the city, is that correct? Correct. Okay, now where will they we, we, My understanding, again, I'm not an attorney, but my understanding is that in essence, when we took over control of the asset, we became the landlord. So now the payments that are due under the lease will be payable to the city, not to the B-21. Okay, so at this point, they'd probably go into the general fund, but perhaps they could go into a revolving account? Okay. Could they go into a revolving fund or no? Have to go yeah, into the- uh, Let me have the CFO tackle that well, one Well, let's make you. him earn his keep yeah. now, so. The payments for, just to clarify, the payments for last year were made in full. Okay. They were paid to the Brockton 21st Century Corporation, and so as part of our final closeout, uh, we'll try to reconcile that. Uh, the next payment for the, the rocks is due actually after the start of the fiscal year, uh, and so there is a payment schedule in the lease. All of those revenues will come in as general fund revenues. Okay. And I, I guess my last question is, uh, and I, upon reflection, I agree with you, Mr. Mayor. If we were to try to shut down Mr. English and his operation, we'd probably spawn a lot of litigation and there'd be allegations of lost revenue and breach of contract. But what steps, well, uh, instead of putting you on the spot, will you please- no, I, I think I, let me take a stab at it because I think I know where you're what, going. What steps are we going to take to get address that arrearage? So, during uh, the last roughly couple of years with B21, um, the Rocks did have a couple of default situations with B21. The lease gave them the opportunity to cure those defaults, and they did. However, in the last time that they cured the default, there was an agreement to language that said upon any additional default, we would not be obligated to allow them to cure it. So I would tell you that in the hypothetical situation that there would be any type of default on the lease, uh, I would look to void the lease. Okay, but, but we will be going back at them to tell them, we'll put them on notice that they do have to address the arrearage. Right. And work out a payment plan if we have to, I assume. All right, my fingers crossed. Right, well. That would be the goal, Councillor. Okay, and the, the last thing, and this is just a suggestion, take it for what it's worth, but it, it does take a lot of time and effort to run a conference center and a, and a, a stadium. Um, if you were to put out an appropriation and ask for a facilities manager in the building department, I think all of us want to protect that asset. Right. Because it's I, I would be happy to address that, Councillor. So, as I think most of you had the opportunity to see, we took over an asset that had not been properly maintained for some time. Even though I had been told verbally about some of the deteriorating conditions there, when I actually got a chance to see it myself, I, I was shocked also. And I agree with you 100% Count, so I think that it's a very valuable asset and it's critical that we protect that asset by shoring it up and, and getting done the work that needs to get done. So in that mind, I've looked at 2019 as a maintenance and planning year. It's going to take some time to do the types of repairs and investments that that facility needs. You know from looking at it, some of the information we sent you before, you know, we'll look at HVAC systems, a leaking roof, uh, lighting, elevator. I mean, there are some significant needs there. So. We are currently working with Amoresco, who we already had an energy services contract with, and they are in the process of putting together an audit that will more fully outline the needs and the cost to address those major ticket items. Uh, because at first glance, it looks as though almost all of those major ticket items offer an opportunity for energy savings, which would make it then eligible under the Amoresco plan, which would allow us to use projected future savings to help pay now. It's 
a much more favorable basis for the city to have to do the work. And we've done this on city buildings and school buildings before. This is being added to an existing agreement that we already have with Amoresco. So right now at this point, we're awaiting uh, that audit. They were literally just in there last week. Um, but upon receiving that audit, I certainly intend to share it with the council. Um, I think that restoring this facility to what it should be is going to require a joint effort of all of us. Um, you know, we're going to have to make a commitment, come to an agreement as to what it needs and get it done. And I think that's going to take all of 2019, possibly into early 2020. Um, so I think that that's the first order of business, is to bring it back to what it needs to be. Now, you've probably noted that we have run a couple of events there. My feeling on that was just the fact that the building has, had been dark for over a year. Um, and my goal was if we could get the building open this year for a handful of events. We're not soliciting any events. We're certainly turning plenty of inquiries aside. But I thought it would be important for the city and for the facility to not be shuttered for a second entire year and that a, a handful of certain events that have run there in the past, and I would anticipate primarily around Brockton-based nonprofits who have held their annual events there every year, places like Brockton Hospital, the Boys and Girls Club, the um, Charity Guild, organizations like that. And I think you would probably share my sentiment. It killed me last year to watch those organizations take those events out of the city. And I just don't think it's good for the city. I don't think it's, it's good for the future use of that facility. Um, so our intent was not to get it back up and running as a full-fledged facility this year, Councillor. It needs a lot of work, but we did feel comfortable that with food prepared off-site, that the function facility portion of it could be used. Uh, the building department was able to get the, uh, the heat and uh, HVAC going, at least for now. Um, and uh, I think that just allowing in a, a select number of events that would keep the facility active instead of having the lights turned out and also allow a few of those major Brockton events to remain in the city this year. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor. Uh, Councillor Cruz had raised his hand. I'm um, all set. Thank you. You're all set. Okay, thank you. I uh, myself would like to have uh, Mr. CFO come up, please. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Like you no, sir. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to catch you off guard. Thank you for being Not here. Not at all. Just, Happy to be here. Okay. We've, um, my colleague um, has just referred to the um, situation with the Shaw Center. And I myself uh, and my colleague have filed a resolve and filed an order to try to get uh, the information going. I am not, um, I mean, I had set a goal that when I, I ran for public office that we were going to resolve the situation with B21 because economic development is not something we see too often here. And I don't call apartments, particularly 40-hour apartments, economic development. Matter of fact, they're really detrimental to our you know, school department in most instances. But anyway, in this case, and we're talking about the Shaw Center and the fact that bills are owed by the, um, the Broughton Rocks, uh, Chris English, and the, um, the, you know, to the Shaw Center. So. Um, we're supposed to see the B21 information come, I believe, on June 17th. Is that correct, Mr. President? At that time, will we be seeing, you know, wh how, what's been paid and what hasn't, and uh, where we plan on going with this? What we are currently analyzing is a listing that was provided from B21 of their expenses to support the maintenance of the stadium and the conference center for the last couple of years. What we're attempting to do is to do our due diligence on those figures to determine or ensure whether or not that maintenance occurred. We have some concerns because the condition of the property, as you well know, uh, is, is not in tip-top shape. So we're working very hard to do an assessment. We were very fortunate uh, through the efforts of the mayor's office to get the building, as he mentioned, uh, to be included in the MRSCO contract. So that was through a waiver 
through the Division of Energy Resources, which is a huge benefit and will be a potential huge money saver for the city because a lot of that energy efficiency work will be done uh, through that contract and, and will be uh, at no real outlay uh, to the city. Okay. So the, the broad answer to your question, Councillor, is yes, we'll, we'll look together at some of those figures to try to figure out uh, uh, what the condition is of the, the property and, and what needs to be done to, uh, to reinvest into it. Okay, and now with these events, are we seeing uh, people paying that have an event at the Shaw Center? It, and we're seeing receivables? I'm, I'm hearing from the mayor that there's a $1,000 rooming fee. So rooming fee, uh, okay. income, yes, uh, m modest to be sure. Yes, oh no, we're, we're big on income here. We, we like a lot of it. <laughs> we can think of plenty of I ways to spend it. we can certainly it. agree on that, yes. <laughs> that, Thank you, I, this is, I just you know, wanted this cleared up and I realize that this takes more than a minute and I'm sure in some instances these records weren't kept the way we would have all liked to have seen. But we believe, uh, we're strong proponents of transparency and I believe the people are very you know, concerned about how it looks and there's plenty of, you know, as, as uh, was mentioned before, nonprofits that want to use it, different city events that are certainly, you know, justified and entitled to use it. And uh, first one that comes to my mind is the Council on Aging Holiday Party. I think it just makes sense for them to be there for so many reasons, and one in particular is it's one level, et cetera. So am I to imagine, too, that at some point, and I realize you're not the um, superintendent of the buildings, that they might they can talk solar energy, they can talk other ways of savings and, and other, uh, all I can think of is when mass save comes to your house and they go through the building. Because I remember when that was you know, being put up and things have changed even though it wasn't that long ago. So those, those are things I was concerned with. Also, that, I'm sorry, I didn't give you a chance to answer that, but the other thing that comes to my mind too is how we saw that the offices at the Rocks were really in deplorable condition. Now, uh, are they gonna be responsible for cleaning up their act? I'll answer the first question as it relates to, to solar and, and other cost savings or revenue generating aspects. Uh, th that, that's partially an operational question, but I can certainly answer from the financial perspective. Sure. And the simple answer is yes, that's an opportunity that we certainly would consider. Uh, there's lots of parking lot space there, uh, and, and there may be even roof space on the conference center. Uh, although the contour of the roof, I'm not a building expert, but I've seen it, uh, could make it difficult, but it is possible to put some solar up there. Uh, as it relates to the rocks, they, uh, they currently have to perform under the lease that they executed with B21, as the mayor noted. Uh, we are now a party to that lease, and so they most certainly have responsibilities under that lease, uh, including being a good tenant. And so uh, w we will make sure that that we're a good landlord and uh, and keep an eye on that tenant. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Thank President. Thank you, Councilor Isaac. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. A uh, quick question could be for either Mr. Clarkson or the mayor. And once again, it's regarding the rocks, um, the Shaw Center and the rocks. Have we done an audit of the actual equipment or value valuables that are in the uh, Shaw Center. It has come to my attention that some things have gone missing in the past few, uh, in the months before we were, we acquired it. So I would like to, the question is, I would like to have an audit done and if that is possible, um, if we can do that because we, we constantly lose valuables in the city. As part of our overall plan, uh, most certainly that will be done. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the requirements of our annual citywide audit was to update our entire capital asset inventory. So that's something we'll be doing actually over the summer. Okay, because there are valuable, there is valuable equipment in the kitchen. I know we got rid of a lot of chairs and tables that were uh, that weren't in great shape, but we do have some things that are of value, and um, I feel that we really should take note of that. So thank you. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Councillor Duranicor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor. Thank, thank you. Uh, with regard to uh, the money that we get from Congas, uh, I see that BCA still uh, has uh, $675,000. I was wondering why they didn't get 5% increase. Sure. So under the old contract, we got 
four percent, but it was a net four. It was a full four with nothing deducted from it. Under the new agreement, it is five percent, but it's five percent then minus the fees and charges. So they tell me that the net is probably more like four and a half. It's an improvement over what we had, but it's not a full five because it's calculated differently. So this is probably more of a CFO question, Counselor, um, but right now it would be hard to quantify exactly what the difference may be. Uh, it certainly is our intention at some point later in the fiscal year to reconcile with BCA and any additional revenues that they're entitled to, they will get. But for planning purposes coming into the uh, year, uh, we kept the same strictly for budget planning purposes, but understanding that there may be some increase, and if there is, it will be divided proportionally with BCA. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Council Nicastro. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Good evening, Mayor. Councilor. Thank you for being here. Um, I have just few, a few questions. Mm -hmm. And the first one is, who negotiated the lease on behalf of the city with the current tenant at the Rock Stadium? Well, it would have been the Brockton 21st Century Corp. The city had no role until we took it over on January 1st. Yes, and who would have done their legal work? Who did the negotiating for them? Back to the original lease? I mean the lease with the current tenant. Right. Which is only a few years old. Right. I, I, mean, I know who their current counsel is. I'm not sure off the top of my head if he's the one that negotiated. Same Brent Warren? Same yeah. I bl their current legal counsel is Attorney Brent Warren. I'm sorry, who? Attorney Brent Warren. Thank you. That's the current legal counsel. I'm assuming a little bit that he was there a few years ago and negotiated the lease. And that's the attorney for Brockton 21st, not for the tenant? Correct. Okay. Okay. I'm just surprised to hear that the commercial lease with the current tenant gives us so little protection and rights um, to go against them. That's not like a usual commercial lease. Well, we inherited the lease. Yes. Um, and you're an attorney. I'm not. So we'll, I'll be happy to have you get a, get a look at it also. But it's we, we're, we're doing an awful lot of due diligence with all this stuff that we have assumed. We thought immediately the, f the first priority was to preserve the asset, and that's some of the work you saw our own people doing in the first couple months, sealing the envelope, trying to get the roof to stop leaking, uh, those types of things, protect, get heat going, those types of things. Um, but we have been, and Trey might want to address this a little bit, but uh, we have requested a lot of documentation from B21. I think it would be fair to say that we've received some of it. I think it would be fair to say that we've received some of what we requested, but we have not received all of it yet. Thank you. And then I have another question, and this is on page 168. Down toward the bottom of the page, it notes that 20% of the Deputy Chief of Staff's salary is funded through the school department. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to know why is that? Uh, that's because um, the Deputy Chief of Staff in his former position uh, worked for the school department and he is, I forget the exact job title, but he was basically their emergency preparedness person. He created the evacuation plans and uh, worked with safety and all of those types of things, which I think we all agree is a critical need in our public schools today in light of what's going on around the country. Um, Tobias is an expert in that field, has numerous certifications. Um, his position at the school department was lost in budget cuts uh, two or three years ago. So we worked out an arrangement where he dedicates the equivalent of one day per week working over at the school department on those issues. In return for that, they're reimbursing us 20% of his salary. It's a way to provide some of that technical assistance to the schools short of them being able to f fully refund the position again. Putting my chair of the school committee hat on, my hope and goal would be that we'd be able to reestablish that position as a full-time position in the schools and that would be a better 
uh, scenario, but the fact of the matter is for the last couple of years, they didn't have anyone performing that function. So um, it's reconciled on the Schedule 19. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, if there are any more questions, uh, Mr. Mayor, you are released. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Uh, you're going to stick around in case something else comes up or you're, you're done for the night? I'm going to leave some highly qualified department heads here to all <laughs> be able to review their budgets with you. And uh, the CFO is a pretty sharp guy, too. So I thank think you. they can handle it. Thank you, sir. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, number two. School Department, Kathleen Smith, Superintendent. Sitting so far away, I don't know if she's, uh, maybe the mayor had scared her. Madam Superintendent, welcome again. Good evening, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, this being the sixth budget that I have presented mm -hmm. to you over the past few years. Um, I, again, uh, want to thank you. This will be my last opportunity speaking to all of you. I want to thank you again for always being there as collaborative partners, uh, always interested in everything happening with our school children in Brockton, and I know going forward you will continue with that. I also want to mention this evening, uh, I do have uh, members of the school committee here with me this evening. I have uh, Vice Chair Ward, Ward 1, uh, Tom Minicello. I have our school committee member from Ward 3, Mark D'Agostino, and school committee from Ward 5, uh, Judy Sullivan, uh, also my chief financial officer, Aldo Petronio. And I do have to say, as I look into the audience, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, my colleague, uh, Superintendent Lewis Lopes from Southeastern Regional Technical Vocational High School. And the reason I mention him is I want you to know that we have had, and I want to thank him for always having a collaborative relationship. Um, he has always, again, it doesn't always happen this way. I am thrilled when our kids get accepted to Southeastern. They get a wonderful education. I've been invited over there. I love seeing our Brockton students, the wonderful things that they're able to do. And I believe uh, Mark Lindy and Bishop Branch are also here who represent our Brockton students so well. So thank you very much. So looking at the budget this evening, it is a very different uh, situation from past years. And I want to start by saying I think uh, everybody can see uh, 16,579 students. We are still the fourth largest school district in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts behind Boston, Springfield, Worcester, and then Brockton. We have 22 schools. That includes our, our high school and three alternative high school settings, 11 elementary, which includes a K to eight. We have six middle schools, uh, one um, special education uh, preschool program. We also have a facility uh, office. We have a parent uh, registration center, and we have the Crosby Administration Building. We oversee close to 1,200 teachers. That is a reduction that I'll talk about this evening and over 2,500 staff members in the Brockton Public Schools, hence we are the biggest department. Looking at six years of budget cutting over the past uh, FY budgets, we go back to FY15, you can see 6.9 million, FY16, 7.9 million, deficits, FY17, 10 million, the highest year FY18, $16.2 million deficit that we had to reconcile and deal with in our school district. Last year was 9.1 million, and this year, and it is sad to say that I am very optimistic, it's still a, what started out as a $5.6 million deficit. There have been some changes which I will address right now. One of the things we did the past couple of years, you've become familiar with it, is the budget barometer. The only way that we were going to make reductions because of the situation where we are so dependent on our state funding was we went through different cycles as money became available to us. First, the mayor's budget. We present that to the city. And all the while during the spring, I want you to know that we met every single Tuesday evening. Sometimes we had to add in a Wednesday or a Thursday looking at ways, and unfortunately, it was continuing to cut our budget. All the while getting to that critical May 15th date when we have to let our certified staff members and we wait till the very end before we make those cuts. This year, when you look at my budget barometer, every year you saw members of our teachers union 
our custodians, our administrative assistants, our paraprofessionals. I can go through every one of those unions, and it affected them by a certain percent. Our goal this year, because we could not suffer another elimination of a teaching position in the schools, was to look at everything else, to follow the state and the House budget, and I know you know, and I was very fortunate, I will not repeat it, but I came before you about two weeks ago and did the State of the Schools Address, and I was able to talk about the advocacy. And I'm sure if you went to the page and looked at State of the Schools, no less than probably 20 occasions where we were in front of state officials, we were around the state, rallying support, and really developing a solid plan as we carefully watch what's happening in the budget at our state house. That being said, we still had to present our budget. And I want to, not to confuse anybody, but I want to make sure that you understand that my goal as a superintendent and what is required of me is I have to present to the mayor, to the school committee, to the city of Brockton, and certainly the city council, what I think it takes to run the Brockton public schools. And I want you to know that had I put into effect programs, additional teachers, um, support for some of our turnaround schools, our research-based curriculum, all the things I spoke to you about two weeks ago, my request would have been over $184 million. That would have been $20 million above the request for last year. Obviously, that's not based in reality, but I want you to know that I did prepare that budget. I sat mm -hmm. down with every one of our department heads and talked about what special education needed, our bilingual department, community schools, um, all of our different offices, you know, teaching and learning. So that is clearly my job as superintendent to share that. So what I did propose in the end, looking at a level services budget, and that would be closing the doors now in June and opening up exactly the same way in September, I requested $173 uh, million, $173,986 for that budget. We were anticipating the mayor's budget. When the budget came through as of 521, we were given um, $168,486,000. That left us at that point with about a $4.8 million deficit at this point. And if you look at my budget barometer, you will take a look at everything that we eliminated or reduced in order for that May 15th date that I spoke about. We did not give out one pink slip, but that came with it some consequences for the district. So if you look at the budget barometer, you're gonna see that at first I did not fill those teachers that were retiring. So that was not a plan to eliminate those positions as we have done in previous years, but that plan was, as of the May 15th date, not to fill those positions at this time, did not require us to lay anybody off, pay unemployment, all the other additional shifts that happen when you do that in a district. We reduced the substitute budget. We reduced uh, additional non-certified personnel. Uh, we looked at things such as closing right now North Middle School, the gradual closing. Um, inventory of supplies that we didn't have to buy, pre-buying. Reducing instructional supplies, natural gas, electricity. You can go through that whole budget barometer and that is how we made up at the time 5.6 million. When the mayor came in with his budget, it was over by $770,000 than we had anticipated based on the shifting of requirements when you look at what the state budget is coming down. With that, we were able to, in round two, bring back those retired positions, that was our first priority, and starting to put back some money into our substitute teacher budget. Oh, good. The next page, again, you will, you will see what I just spoke about. This is still a work in progress, and I wanna bring to your attention, I was just looking at my notes as I carefully watched the state budget. <laughs> so as the House and Senate have given their recommended budgets and are now will be pretty much going into their compromise committee, some of the things, and I really am not optimistic all the time anymore after what we have watched happened, but as I stand here today, I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic that they get it, that they understand that they have to fund our school budget statewide so that every child has an adequate education. And when you look at some of the things, and I'm just gonna speak about the house budget very quickly, it talks about a reserve for districts with high percentages of low-income students, six million for additional academic support for low-income students in districts who would appear to 
uh, have to go through a competitive grant process. They talk about $10.5 million for transitional assistance for districts whose Chapter 78 has been significantly impacted by the change in low-income enrollment that occurred over the past five years. You could have written this for Brockton. Mm -hmm. So that being said, we're optimistic in waiting for the uh, state to finish their budget and in looking at some of the so-called extra accounts that they've put together, you know that we will be very carefully watching uh, what's happening there. So that is how we balance the budget, not with reduction of personnel, but with reduction of anything that we could aside from hitting that classroom. The next page again shows uh, just what I have spoken about, about balancing the budget, and the mayor already brought to your attention. When you look at how hard we fought, and again, I will go back to 1993 when you talk about <laughs> charters. There was a reason for bringing charters when you looked at Ed Reform back in 93. The idea was an incubator for great ideas, for best practices to share, for us to be able to look at maybe some autonomies that worked. It's a far cry from what we're seeing nowadays. I'm all for choice for parents. I'm all for being competitive and wanting people to come to your district for, because of the product. But when you clearly look at, and again, don't forget, when funding comes in for our students, it is based on a very complicated formula that takes into account if a student has English language learner services, special education services, low income, all kinds of different categories. So when you look at our per pupil cost in Brockton, and to pay that out in charter costs is something that needs to be fixed and looked at as to the students that are choosing to go to other locations. When you look at this, you clearly see over the past, and I want to call attention to FY17 to now, an addition of almost $3 million every year. What we could have done with that $3 million for our students in the Brockton Public Schools. So clearly the mayor has addressed that. I know that's something, again, that the uh, state legislature needs to pay attention to while they're also looking at the foundation budget review. I talked about balancing the budget. And this is exactly what I just talked about. After five years of reduction in force, we could not sustain any further elimination of certified or non-certified personnel positions. This budget plan reflects optimism that the Legislative Compromise Committee will add additional funds based on the House and Senate budget plans. And again, the Brockton Public Schools FY20 budget was to reduce anything but positions, et cetera, that directly support our classroom. The next slide is something that our uh, legislative representatives asked us for as they do their hard work uh, in the State House. They wanted to actually see, and I thought this was good for you to see, the number of positions that we have lost over the past five years. We are down 174 teaching positions in the Brockton Public Schools. And when you look at the number of students we're down, you'll see that number at the top. It does not correlate with the number of teachers we should have in our classrooms. Yep. We're down 128 of our support uh, positions, paraprofessionals, MTAs. Mm -hmm. Next page has the class sizes across the district. We're stable this year. We're stable because we haven't had a lot of growth in our student population, although there always is transiency in students coming and going. But you will see, I do find it unacceptable 25 to 31 in a kindergarten class and sharing a paraprofessional. And those of you that have been around five-year-olds, <laughs> I think you'll understand the challenge that that puts on any teacher, let alone not having the support that they need. I also am very proud of the fact that this is the first year, and this was done for the right reasons as we try to grow preschool you know, in our community that before a child starts kindergarten in the Brockton Public Schools, they need to be five by September 1st. With yeah. all of the standards and the goals and the mandates that a child now has in a full day kindergarten program, that is something that took us a long time to go from December 31st last year to November 1st, and this year will be the first time that our children starting kindergarten have a chance as a five-year-old. But look at these numbers, you'll see our average class size is grade one through grade five, again, 25 to 31. And I wanna tell you, I walk into classes, I count all the time. I'm talking mostly 27, 28 in the class. Same thing for our middle and our high school. It's time for the district to start to bring back elective positions at our high school, opportunities for our students, critical opportunities for our students in middle school as they prepare to go to uh, rigorous instruction at a high school level. 
My last page here, or getting to the end, talks about our uh, philosophy of needs. If you advocate, as we will continue to do, as we've talked about all over the state, what we have done in the city of Brockton, thanks to all of you, thanks to our mayor, and thanks to our community for being behind us, that the legislature, the governor, needs to act. And they need to act on looking at the foundation budget review for adequate special education funding, adequate health insurance, adequate English language learner funding, and low-income student funding. This will lead to investment in education of all our students in the Commonwealth. Reduction in class sizes, uh, teaching and technology for students, advanced and supported facility ongoing maintenance, upgrades, renovations, new facilities. And the last page that I will talk about, I probably am going to need some assistance here, but this is on our non-net school spending, which is our busing. And this is another critical need for our city. I talk about what a wonderful thing our forefathers did in building that Brockton High School. A beautiful facility as far as where it is located, the, anybody that was there on graduation day just to look out and, and to see everything that we can offer our students. But that being said, high school drives that busing. When we built that high school, kids had to come clear across the city from all angles to, now remember, you are not required to bus high school students. We are required to bus high school students for the very nature of where we placed our high school. So we have had to increase. Some of this is we um, contract with first student, and I want you to know when we put a bid out, we usually get one uh, bid that comes in. And when you look at something like that, and I want you to know first student is a great partner. They have met so many of our needs. They have gone above and beyond for our kids in this city. They bust them there every single day. Our kids get transportation back home if for certain zones in the city, if they're doing after school activities. It allows our kids to have an excellent experience in the Brockton Public Schools. That being said, when you look at the cost of some of the special education transportation, mm -hmm. our homeless transportation, McKinney Vento, sure. which by federal uh, funds is required. You know, we're busing kids at high cost with not the return uh, that we get 100%. So we have gone from last year um, requesting or ending up having to spend over $12 million. This year, looking at, and you can see the additional costs in um, gas, um, in ad additional bus for charter, uh, regular transportation. We pretty much have kept at, I think it's 50 and 52 buses and vans that go throughout the city for three tiers of busing. But our, um, our transportation is up again, uh, certainly almost, I think, another $2 million. And right now, um, what is being proposed is $7.8 million, and that is a deficit of over $6 million that I have been assured um, by the mayor and our chief financial officer of the city that they uh, have a plan for making up so that we can continue the busing that we're providing to our students. And that tonight is my presentation. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Superintendent. Uh, councilors, questions, concerns, issues, petrified? Council Borgard. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. First of all, thank you, Superintendent, and congratulations for another terrific year with the um, graduation. And really, just this is just a mere compliment to um, say, and I really, this is also a hint to other heads of departments or et cetera, this packet that you present us before the budget explaining the successes, the challenges, et cetera, that you make available to the public, uh, explaining what goes on in the schools, and the, your, your um, how would I say, your challenges, your accomplishments, the whole uh, mission of all the schools and the programs j just really is worthwhile. You know, like I said, I read everything that I receive, and this is phenomenal, and this allows for us to go out in the community and say, you want to know why it costs so much? Because this is what goes into a quality education in a school with a system with economic challenges. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Superintendent, uh, could you give us a status update on any collective bargaining agreements? Where are we? Will anything come up during FY 2020 that might impact, or are we pretty well squared away? Well, we did finish, and I'm very proud. Um, when I came on as superintendent, and I really wasn't sure this was going to be met with 
um, pleasure, but the uh, union and uh, the management school committee, we agreed to do interest-based bargaining. I know you're aware of that. We had two um, bargaining sessions, a three-year contract. We just finished up. It was ratified, I believe, in early May uh, with our teachers' union. So for the next three years, um, they did have a small increase this year. We had very, very little to work with. I think we had about $600,000 to work with with our union. Uh, I give them credit because they did work with us. And for the next two years, I think for, for three years, it's 5.3% increase. I'm sorry, I'm looking for Aldo Petronio. <laughs> Over the over the three years, including this year. Oh, I'm sorry. Why was I thinking 5.3, 3.3? So that is our, our biggest union. Um, we feel that allows us to stabilize the district, um, to you know, to be able to build back, as I just spoke about in this uh, in this uh, next period. And we've been able to finish up with a number of our other bargaining units. We have some in session right now, our school police, our administrative assistants, but we have finished up on a number of our bargaining units. So going in, the biggest one is your teachers' union, and you are set for the next two years. Okay, I guess the last thing I want to say, and I don't want to get too melancholy and ruin my image, but... <laughs> uh, it, <laughs> you're right. It, it's interesting when you go into public life, whether you're appointed or elected, you, you have your supporters and you have your detractors, and you have your successes and you have your failures, and we learn a lot from our failures. And the final analysis is, if you have your integrity when you leave, you've got it all. And you, Superintendent Smith, will leave with your integrity. You've always done what you felt was right for the kids, mm -hmm. for the staff, for the city, and there's no way of really saying thank you. So, thank you, Council. That's it. It's the nicest thing you could have said to me. You're all set. I'm set. Thank you, uh, Council Durankar. Uh, thank you, Mr. <coughs> President. Good evening, Superintendent. Um, I would like to quote uh, Nelson Mandela. Uh, he said that education is the most powerful weapon that you can used to save the world, and I think for 42 years of your life, I think you've shown that. Your unwavering commitment and dedication, not only to the city of Brockton, but why not uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And although uh, I made sort of like the same statement last year, and this is something that I will always say about you, I think you epitomize uh, what it means to be an educator, not only uh, here in the city of Brockton, but I think across our nations. And I think uh, with uh, the conversation that I had with you for the past uh, couple of years, way before politics, I think you truly demonstrate not only your ability uh, to understand intelligence, but your capacity to comprehend competent. And I think by virtue of you taking the time to uh, not only uh, you know analyze what's going on in our school system, uh, but also to think about what is best for all of us. And I think uh, your service uh, to this city uh, will never be forgotten. And I think uh, we just saw it at the Brooklyn High School graduations, and I watch you closely, how happy you were shaking hands with almost every single student. So in the spirit of uh, education, and of course um, what that piece of education has done for me personally, I would like to thank you uh, for everything that you've been doing. And I do not know what you're going to do uh, in the future, but I wish you nothing but the best and keep up the good work. I would be remiss uh, not to acknowledge uh, your staff uh, you're well intelligent and competent staff because, believe it or not, you are an excellent superintendent, but most of your work wouldn't be possible without uh, the amazing staff that you have in our school, your school committee. So I thank you and also thank them for giving every single student in our city an opportunity not only to learn, but to learn from the best. So I wish you again nothing but the best and keep up the good work and I hope to see you again. Yeah, thank you, Councillor, and I couldn't agree more. Um, I've been very fortunate uh, to have had an excellent staff, um, obviously, all of you know, through very challenging times. Um, we do a lot of serious work. Uh, I think everybody is there, and, you know, I don't want to overuse the statement, but it is there in the best interest of every one of our kids in the city of Brockton. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, sir. Council Cruz. Thank you. I'm not going to give the big speech yet. Uh, you know what I think of the job you've done and, and you being here. I do have, I think it might even be some questions for Aldo, 
I'm looking at the out of state district to out of district tuition. Now explain to me the the sped prepay. Have we been for the last five years paying the next year's tuitions out of the cu current budget? We're allowed to if we have excess funds. We can prepay up to three months. No, I'm sure we're allowed to if we did it. So yes. <laughs> um, so, and, and what we do is, well, you know, our budget overall is uh, about 240 million dollars. So we try and budget about a 1% factor in there. So at the end of the year, I s you know, try to manage it so we end up with a couple million dollars. That couple million then I try to pre-purchase for the next year, those special ed tuitions because we've had all these years of, of budget cuts. So it's a way of putting a little, uh, taking some of the pressure off the future years. And I'm just a little confused. Are we doing that this year or I'm looking at some We're of the work that it yes. shows that we're not doing it, or was that just That's one of your proposed budgets? It's not, it should, it should be on there for a million and a half. Um, so uh, page 27 in the big book shows minus a million and a half. Page 27. In the black binder that we received. So that's the fiscal 2020 budget estimate out of district tuition. Oh, why don't you give me the dollar amount? So the request was for, uh, Six million two hundred fifty. The mm -hmm. budget is four million seven fifty. Right. It's actually a close to an eight million dollar cost. That line. And how do we know who we're paying? Well, it's almost one hundred students that we have that go special ed out of district. Mm -hmm. um, we can't identify the students to anyone, but we use a, a first initial and a last initial of their names when the bills are come back and forth between the schools. But we know who we sent. We know what the cost so of the you know, is. So we know at this point where they will be next year. One of the things with that that's very difficult, you know, is a student could move into Brockton tomorrow and we would be responsible if they came in with an IEP with an outside okay, placement. Okay, that's uh, always something, and some of this is for the people at home to understand, but if somebody moves out of our district, are we responsible for them, a special ed? No, if they move to another town, the other town is responsible, just as Brockton would be if somebody were to move in. So at the first there are times school, during a year, I think there is some cost sharing involved at certain times during the year, depending on when the student moves in or moves out. So I guess, so this is about two thirds of you'll pay. I mean, I guess my question is, how do we know who to pay? Because you, I mean, so you'll know, I mean, I'm looking at the lists of where some of these students go. Uh, you know, collaborative programs, private day school. So you, you're you actually paying those pe those schools Yes, it, now? It, is, it is through the process. So you go through an IEP process. Sometimes we actually recommend, we will give parents a number of places to visit that actually meet the child's needs. Yeah. And then we will approve that particular placement that we have, you know, a relationship with. Uh, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education also will give you a list of places that are approved for students to go to. We continually follow up to sh see if the student has made progress. It isn't something that they leave us and then we have no relationship with the school or the student or the family. They and continue to have to go through the educational process. And then are we responsible, do we track that IEP and all? I mean, once the students in, Always. in our have, system. We have a department head that actually connects with any of our outside placements. And as I said, you know, you, you have to show that they're meeting the goals of the educational plan, that the student is meeting progress, uh, or in fact, it could be an additional placement. And there are some that are very, very expensive. Could be transportation. We have some students that are in residential placements. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's my other question. And again, some of it's for just for the public to know. So this page shows a budget for fiscal year 2020 of 5872 for out of district tuition. That does not include any transportation, correct? So transportation is above and beyond that. Right. We have special education transportation separately that could and involve those students okay. and most likely does. And, most, and usually does. Yes. Thank you. All right. And those you. are some of the costs that are very hard to contain. You know, we, we, you can imagine uh, some need special vans, special assistance, you know, one-to-one you know, -one nurse, you know, traveling with particular students. You know, we did a great job years ago by not having students 
uh, outside our district, and I don't have to name the places that no longer exist. Mm -hmm. So if we can keep a student in-house, we do everything we can to develop a program so that the student is able to take part uh, in an educational setting, even if they're substantially separate. If, in fact, it is a student that is in outside placement, it could be a student very involved or a family that has gone through the process, is not pleased with the progress the student is making, rejects the educational plan, we've gone to mediation, we go to the Board of Special Education Appeals. If we feel that we can service that youngster, sometimes we win and the student stays in the district and we have to show that we can make progress or other times the parents are given uh, the opportunity to have an outside placement. Thank you. And uh, then I will say, good luck in the future and thanks for everything you've done for us. So, thank, thank you, you. Councilor. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor thank uh, you. Thank you. Good evening, Superintendent. I, I will say the same thing as my colleagues. Thank you for all you've done for us, for our school system, and I'm very proud. I've told you many times I'm very proud of um, you as our superintendent. And, um, and just thank you. But uh, my question to you, or maybe Aldo, is um, on the same page that Councillor Cruz was asking, I, what is Virtual Academy Greenfield? Uh, excellent question. So when we talk about options and school choice, these are actually online programs. They're approved by the state where a student does not have to attend the Brockton Public Schools 180 days and all the requirements of the hours that we have to educate the student. And it, it's almost like a choice. So the student that lives in Brockton chooses an online program to get their credentials up to leading up to a high school diploma, and we need to pay the cost for that. Wow, okay. Now how do we advocate, like how do students find out about these things? Because, I mean, some yeah, of the they, stuff- They have to market, they, we certainly do not. Okay. <laughs> we do not market, you know, uh, online programs, they exist. They're on the DESE website. If you go on the DESE website, mm -hmm. you'll see that yeah, that yeah. is an Turns option like that crazy. is approved by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. We have started to look at, as a district, opportunities. We have something called Odyssey Wear, where a student can make up coursework if they're behind for whatever reason, sometimes during summer school, so that is an online option. But there are other um, districts on the South Shore that are starting to actually have teachers uh, from each of the district teaching a particular, might be a very difficult course to get uh, for some of our higher performing students, especially in districts that don't have large class sizes and a student needs an AP, you know, something that's difficult uh, to have uh, in a district. So they are starting to do this. Online is coming. Um, I know people in, you know, getting college education, uh, all, but we see them on TV all the time now, and these are conferred degrees. So at this point, we're tiptoeing in, we're not completely, even on our end, into the virtual school for our students. Okay. Um, approximately how much does the average uh, high school student cost us? And this is once again for people. But when you say the average, it really does depend. So we have uh, a little over 12,000, almost 13,000 per pupil expenditure for our students. Hence my comment. When you take into account the blended rate of, and, and you look at other districts, their per pupil expenditure might be very different than our you know, 12,000. When you look at Southeastern Regional and all the equipment and all of the technology, their cost is a little bit more expensive to educate their students. When you look at the average student, and this is my issue when I talk about charters, the average student probably costs, and the student that is um, a student that comes to school, doesn't require additional supports, you know, makes it through in their, you know, kindergarten and 12 years of education, uh, does not need, again, and, and I don't want to go through all the additional supports because if a student needs it, it's important for us to provide it. But they probably cost about $8,000 a year to educate. Very different than the over 12,000 we get. Hence, when you take a student from the Brockton Public School, could be your average student, you're not just getting that 8,000, you're getting the over 12,000 for our per pupil cost. And that's why when you look at $3 million on charter, uh, reimbursement mm -hmm. that continues to increase up to almost what over 18 million this year that's one I don't have an issue with competition I don't have an issue with people choosing I have an issue with the way that it's funded one of the reason for my question is I'm looking at 
the cost per student at Norfolk Ag Agricultural mm -hmm. High School, which is at 22,594 per student. Yeah. So that was the reason I just wanted people. Good, good to point out. And again, they do an excellent job. We have a number of students. So when students have those opportunities, and I'm pleased that they have a technical education opportunity. They have an opportunity Culture, for, yeah. for instance, for us, Norfolk Agricultural. So these are things that we support. Uh, our, our guidance counselors let our students know that these are options. We collaborate with these schools, and as I said, we're pleased when there are graduates from Brockton there. Thank you. Last question, and I've asked this in the past. We always see the expenditures, but we rarely see, and I, I'm sure it's probably in this book, but I, um, I'm asking, when we rent out, we pay a lot when we, um, when we use the uh, <coughs> stadium, um, the ice skating rink, for example, or wherever. I saw that on one of the pages, there's multiple rental fees that we pay, pay out. What about the fees that actually come in? Like when we have outside mm -hmm. um, groups using our auditorium, stadium, gymnasium, where, where, where is that in our budget? And I'm right. sure I could give you a little history on it with community schools, but what I will tell you <laughs> is it is now in a facility department. So a number of years ago, I can't remember the exact year, we formed our own facility department. Um, it's really benefited the schools in many ways. So the facility office takes care of rentals. Uh, Zalinda DePina is up in the community school office. Mm -hmm. So she is our administrative assistant that works with the public. But all of that funding uh, goes into um, that particular department. Ken Thompson is our director in the department. So, so it, should, it should be in the book. Revolving. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, it, right, it's a revolving account. Yeah. Versus so it's with everything else or it's not it's separate, okay. Just, um, so I'll take a look at that, but I've always asked and I've always wondered what happens <coughs> to um, all the yeah. income that actually you know, comes in. One of the things, and I'll give my one last pitch, when you talk about, you know, in days gone by, everybody wanted the use of Brockton High School Auditorium, mm -hmm. which we continue to support, make sure the sound system, the seats, the we do the best we can in a 50-year-old facility. But as people have built new facilities around us, we've lost some of the dance recitals and things that used to bring in thousands of dollars each year. So, you know, that has been watered down. I, I can attest to that, having been up in community schools, that that is very changed. Mm -hmm. And we can't use any of that funding that used to, that comes in to fix up the auditorium? I mean, I know the auditorium needs work, so. We do, we work with the facility office. We have projects going on. You know, I, I think when I was here last, I talked about East uh, Junior High, East Middle School, yeah, yeah, and needing new seats in the auditorium. That yeah, comes out of our yeah. revolving account, our facility funds uh, and other, uh, other funds. But today we're over at the Davis School and we need to finish up one more pod, you know, putting the walls up. That's a summer project. We're finishing putting tiles and pulling up rugs. So there is always something going on. Hence, it, when I mentioned the facility department, I think, again, that was an excellent decision. It allows us to be able to do some of the upkeep on our own building with plumbers, electricians, uh, HVAC people, uh, things that make a difference and getting things done in a timely manner. Which, so you're saying a lot of it gets done in-house, which yes. saves us a lot of money. Well, thank you again, and you've always answered all, all my questions. I appreciate it, and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, anyone else? Madam Superintendent, you are dismissed. Thank you very much. Let's call to the uh, office the other school. <laughs> Southeastern Regional School, Lewis Lopes, Superintendent. This is yours. Mr. Lopes, welcome. Well, thank you. Good evening, counselors. Um, I'll be, I know you have a pretty busy schedule, so I'll be somewhat brief, but again, uh, if you have specific questions, I'm prepared to answer those. Um, I was, it, it, you mentioned our t that uh, you'd like departments to talk about our mission statements at Southeastern. Our mission statement is to transform students into lifelong learners. We believe that all our students will graduate college and career ready, and uh, and that's that's really kind of at the forefront of what we do. Uh, this Wednesday, we graduated. Uh, we have our 51st commencement. We will graduate our largest class ever. Um, and about 64% of those students come from the city of Brockton. So, so Brockton obviously continues to be our largest contributing community. We, had, we serve nine communities. The budget for FY20 request is uh, $4,051,342. That's an increase of 134154 over the current fiscal year. 
Um, the enrollment is up slightly, eight students uh, over the previous year. As I was sitting here, I was looking at kind of the growth. Um, over the past six years, we've seen an increase in student population from the city of Brockton of 20 percent. Um, and uh, one of the things, and I'm joined today by, by uh, Mark Lindy and Tony Branch, who both who represent uh, the Brockton, um, uh, city of Brockton. And although our enrollment has gone up 20 percent, our uh, per pupil costs have, uh, have gone up 17 percent. So we're able to kind of try to manage that as, as much as we can. We understand that. Uh, that the school department budget is a large part of your budget. So what we can do to try to um, not give up the quality of our education, but uh, but uh, tackle things uh, and control the cost. So so one of the ways we've been able to control the cost this year, when the governor's budget first came out, the increase was actually $152,000. Uh, but we've been able to to lower that slightly. Uh, it's still $134,000. Uh, over this current year, but uh, one of the things we were able to do is is hold steady health health insurance at zero percent. We also, um, by September, will be producing ninety percent of our own electricity, um, so that helps uh, helps also control uh, energy costs. So by controlling some of those some of those budget busters like energy and health care, uh, um, we can um, we can try to keep the costs and, and continue to operate at foundation budget at net school spending. So. I think with that, I'll kind of answer any questions that people may have. Uh, thank you, uh, Council Borgard. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And thank you, Superintendent, for being here, as usual, to give a brief and impressive. So I'm impressed. Ninety percent. That's a serious uh, the opportunity to save. So congratulations on that. But really, I, I just want to point out that I, I find myself at your institution of higher learning. I have been there when you have had those parent information days. Wow, talk about organized and professional. And I find myself, you know, coming in periodically because uh, we, we try to promote all the programs actually you have in your um, after graduation program for the, you know, adults and um, collaborative because people are interested in later on becoming electricians or plumbers when they've done something else in their lives or something. And uh, we get all the packets. So everyone is professional. The school's really organized. The students are terrific. So good for you and good luck and congratulations on class of 2019. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, anyone else? Council Hall. Thank you, Mr. President. Good evening, Superintendent. Um, and I, I do want to recognize again Mark and Tony, um, fellow elected officials that really do yeoman's work. So, um, you know, every year I, I acknowledge how um, impactful Southeastern has on the Brockton schools and all the kids that go there. Um, you know, I was there last year with Tony um, and, and, and Mark when the governor came. Uh, and it's, it's an unbelievable campus. Um, recently I've gone there every Saturday my kids played in the basketball league there so I just want to thank you for the impact that the school is, is really um, having um, not everybody wants to go to Brockton High School you know and, and there isn't a need to do that I mean the trades are um, a, a really good professional uh, type of situation so I just want to thank you I mean I, I, I don't think the budget is much to question it is what it is relative to Southeastern, but I do just want to recognize you, Superintendent, for what you're doing and the impact you're making, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Sullivan. Uh, Council Cruz. Actually, I wasn't going to say anything, but I'll do a little spiel for you to advertise. Public should know that the average age of a plumber in Massachusetts is 58 years old. Yeah. The average yeah. age of an electrician is 53 years old. <laughs> if you got kids that don't know what they want to do, get them over there. <laughs> get them over there and get them in the trades, because let me tell you, all the other jobs are filling up, but 58 years old is the average age of a plumber in this state. Five years from now, you may not be able to get a plumber to come to your house, so send your kids over to Southeastern Regional and get, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll all get them some work, so. And, and within five years, they're making 82,000 average salary, so. Exactly, so. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Council Cruz. Uh, Superintendent, I think uh, Council Lely wants to apply. Go right. ahead, Council. Is it too late <laughs> to be a freshman? Right, yeah. No, um, as as someone who's, you know, doing doing the whole college thing right now, I, I always say if I could go back, I would I would uh, go to Votech and do a trade. It's uh, uh, you know, we we don't we don't shine enough of a spotlight on it. I know this isn't fully on the budget, and I apologize, but it is uh, you know, the the generation that is is coming out of our schools now, uh, sees you know more debt more all you know all kinds of all kinds of uh constrictions on them 
um, from college that are really just ridiculous. You know, the the amount of money that you know we put into some of these degrees just is not. It isn't worth it. Um, you know, I, I go to, I'm, I'm friends with a set of twins. One is getting a degree and one is an electrician and one is making what the other one is racking up in debt. Um, they've re, you know, we've, we've ignored the trades too long. They're not some, they're not some place to send some kid. These are, you know, these are jobs that build the country and they're very important. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to see schools like Southeastern making it, you know, making it such a an easy thing to do a, you know a productive thing to do thank you so you're applying uh yeah can <laughs> i is it too late to apply for the freshman class <laughs> <laughs> thank you counselor uh if, if, if there are Councilor Monahan? yeah oh well, you're at it i'll brag a little bit just want to say <laughs> no my son thomas it, it's just what a great education he got uh at southeastern regional he graduated 2001 he's been in the marine corps since 2002 and from what he learned there actually he's been in charge he's actually now writing the curriculum for small arms repair school in kentucky so he's doing he's had a great education there and he's doing quite well right now so thank you and thank you for uh, the education he got at southeastern regional good uh, can i affect if I can add just yeah, two things. One, we're always looking for retired military personnel that want to come back and teach. Uh, they're wonderful, usually, uh, in my experience. And so I just want to thank Kathy Smith again. I know she's retiring. Uh, we just found out today uh, that we had to receive uh, uh, an additional grant from the, from the governor's office uh, to partner and expand access. Uh, and it's a grant that's between both school departments. And, and more often than not, Kathy and I are being asked to, to broker uh, how other uh, inner city schools and regional votes uh, work so well together and, and uh, Brockton is really considered a model for that. So, so I wanna thank Kathy for, for her support and, uh, and I've been blessed to be able to work with her uh, and the previous superintendents as well, so thank you. Thank you for, all, for what you do and you too are dismissed, sir. And Madam Clerk, uh, number four. Library, Paul Engel, Director. Hey, Paul. Welcome. Hi. Uh, good evening, City Council President Rodriguez, and good evening, members of City Council. Um, I have a prepared statement. Um, before I begin, I would like to take a moment Sorry. to recognize the chair of the Library Board of Trustees, Mr. Mark Lindy, who's here Thank in support. And I'd also like to recognize that I have two staff members here in support. Uh, okay. Department Head Paula Jones is here, and ESL Coordinator Melise Vega is here. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, our mission statement is... The Brockton Public Library is a free, open, and essential resource that fosters literacy, stimulates imagination, and provides access to technology and information that provides lifelong learning to strengthen our community. To expand a bit on that, with our three locations, which are open a total of 90 hours a week, we are a hub of community interaction and engagement. We are a center for early childhood, child, teen and adult education, offering a wide range of programming in the disciplines of ESL, STEM, fine arts, humanities, and technology. We hold nearly half a million items in our libraries and circulated over 200,000 items last year. Nearly half of our residents have library cards. The Brockton Public Library is a member of the Old Colony Library Network and we share resources between all libraries in Massachusetts. We provide open internet access, a large number of online resources, and we work in partnership with many local, regional, and state organizations to offer programs such as tax preparation, career orientation, and college preparation. Additionally, the library provides a variety of spaces for community use for events, programming, civic engagement, and information sharing. We aggressively seek out funding through various grants organizations and work in partnership with the Office of the Mayor to apply for grant funding. The Library Foundation, a 503C corporation, is our fundraising arm. Uh, council President Rodriguez, with your permission, I would like to present the Council the fiscal year 2020 library budget. 
This is a fundamentally level funded budget with targeted increases based on the collective bargaining agreement between the city and local SEIU 888. Okay. I would like to point out to the city council that the mayor's recommended 2020 budget exceeds the state minimum appropriations requirement established by the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners, allowing for Brockton to receive the maximum award of state aid we qualify for and keeps the Brockton Library System fully certified by the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners, which in turn keeps us a member of the statewide library consortium. Uh, I'm happy to accept any questions from the council. Uh, council Cruz. Just a quick question, and I should know this. What are the branch libraries open now, uh, days and hours, the two? <laughs> uh, they are open, one is open Monday and Wednesday, Monday from nine to five, p.m. 9 a.m. 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. and the other branch is open Tuesday Thursday the identical same, hours same thing yeah mm -hmm. uh, don't you. ask me which branch is open when <laughs> I'm sure Mark knows I'm sure Mark knows too <laughs> all right thank you I should know that off the top of my head but I haven't had to recently so thank you you're welcome thank, thank you, you Council Chairman. Council Dorian uh, thank you Mr. President Paul it's good to see you um, uh, some of you folks know that uh, the Brockton Public Library is a place that uh, does have a special place in my heart, and I would like to acknowledge you know that. Uh, some of your colleagues, given the fact that I myself uh, used to be a board member of the Brockton Public Library until 2017. But um, you know, I would like to acknowledge uh, Mark Lenny, also Miles Vega, mm -hmm. who, Mr. President, was my English teacher uh, when I first came in this country, I believe in 2000, 2010. The reason I'm saying this is the fact that you know sometimes. Um, I'm hearing people saying that, you know, we don't need library. So uh, one of the most important things that I'm seeing so far as uh, Superintendent Kathleen Smith was talking about education is some of our kids within the city uh, where their parents do not have access to the internet, mm -hmm. uh, do not have access to a computer or desktop, and the only place they can possibly go to do their homework That's is right. the working public library. So the reason I'm saying this is that I can use myself as a testament in regard to, you know, the greatness of a public place like that and also all the opportunity that we can possibly receive. So for me, I guess it is one of the most important agencies that we can have in our city, given the disparity that we are facing. So um, in regard to what you've been doing with the little that you have, I would like to thank you uh, for whatever you are doing. And of course, your staff, Marlis Vega and uh, Mark Lendy, you know, for keeping up the spirit of Brockton and lives. And, 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 and with that being said, I guess I think I can attest this. I think some of my colleagues do know that, you know, this is a place where, you know, all of us sometimes go there either to read a book or to go to an event. And I think it is one of the places that people do talk about when they talk about the greatness of Brockton. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Borger. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, thank you for Hi, being Councilor. here this evening. Let's let's highlight uh, what BLF does for funding for uh, activities with the library and make it uh, known that uh, everything is kicking off for um, summer and the summer reading program where what we our kids would read more than a lot of other kids in a lot of other communities and uh, really I just I was hoping you'd mention for just one brief moment mass memories and how you plan on doing your own program a mini version of that for our city sure I, I can okay. give you some headlines uh, we ran a program a couple of, uh, what was it a week ago uh, no 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 it was May 18th, May 18th. Yes, time, okay. time <laughs> I've gone through a lot since May 18th um, we're, we uh, had the UMass Boston come down with a team of archivists and, uh, and and transcribers and we invited the city to bring their photographs and their images and their letters in to digitize them they will be, and then we added metadata from their interviewing them, uh, the, the, the people who brought the photos in. Uh, all of that's going to be housed on the Mass Memories Roadshow website as uh, uh, the, hist the history of Brockton through these images. And we also will receive a, f a copy of all the metadata and the images as well, which I in turn plan on uploading to the Digital Commonwealth. Uh, I had the idea and I want to uh, flesh this out a little bit, so it's a little, little early to have, to continue this, to have this in more than just a one-off event, but to have it an ongoing series. So I'd like to, uh, I have the idea to, to have like a monthly digitization day at the library so people can continue to bring us our, our photographs, or your, the, your photographs, <laughs> and we can continue to build that Digital Commonwealth collection up. Um, you'd be surprised, I'm a member of Digital Commonwealth. Um, the second most searched um, 
location in, the Mass in Massachusetts, uh, the people who are searching the digital commonwealth are from the city of Brockton, believe it or not. We are the second, number two, on Pretty searching neat. the digital commonwealth. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Thank you Councillor. Uh, anyone else? Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, Councillor Sullivan, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Paul. How Good are evening, you? Good evening, Councillor. Um, thank you for all that you do um, and, and everybody that works at the library. Just had one question relative to a line item. Um, it's on page 162. It's under the Library Purchase of Service. Uh, it's deemed public safety. Um, you requested zero. The mayor came back at 40,000. And I'm just trying to figure out what exactly that is. Well, when we, when Mark and I met with uh, the CFO Troy Clarkson and Budget Director Karen Preval, which I, I, I had it in my notes, but I neglected to say it was a pleasure working with you two, and we look forward to continuing. Um, we had actually moved that uh, line, the 40,000, up into overtime, um, and then by the magic of, of numbers, they got moved back down to where it initially was. So if you look right. back to budget, uh, 2019 yep. budget, uh, revised budget, you'll see it's there. Um, and I actually don't know why it was moved down there again. Maybe my CFO, would you mind? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Council Sullivan, that was really a, a function of bookkeeping. That money is to pay for the security uh, from the Brockton Police at, at the library. Uh, okay. And, and so we thought it was more really appropriate because the way it works uh, from an accounting perspective here is that individual departments actually pay for those police details themselves uh, through the budget. So we thought really it was more of a purchase of service. It wasn't overtime for the library employees. So we're really trying to uh, book the expense in a more appropriate place. Okay, okay. And, and kind of in that No increase in the appropriation, it's just moving right, that 40,000. Right, you just switched to where the itemization was. Right. Um, and, and Paul, or maybe this is, you know, I think this would be more directed to you. In terms of, and I ask this question, uh, I think every year, in terms of um, safeguarding some of the valuables, there's expensive artwork at the main library. Um, there's autographs from Andrew Carnegie. Um, okay. I, I know there was some um, some customers of the library um, that weren't too pleased about the parking situation and yeah. the darkness. I just want to know, and I know it's it's not an overnight thing, but first of all, how are we relative to um, outside safety and visibility for men and women that, that go there, park in the parking lot, that are going to be walking in at night or, or dusk, and then also the interior, how are we in terms of safeguarding the customers and more importantly also the employees that work there um, from theft and the like because there is some valuable mm -hmm. irreplaceable yeah. items in there. Well, I'll take your, your the first part first. Um, Thank you. We worked with the mayor's office and uh, Department of Public Works, and if you if you go there tonight or go there any night, that parking lot across the street on White, on White Avenue yep. is very well illuminated now. They added uh, two or three additional lights. And so the parking lot is well illuminated. Are the uh, cameras as well? Uh, the cameras, that's my next point. The cameras that are outside uh, that belong to the city, uh, I worked with the um, ITS, and now I have access to those cameras, Great. as well as Keith Joquet, and uh, so we can monitor the outside from our desks. Okay. And then uh, to, to come inside the building, um, since I've been here, I've added, I don't know, 18 cameras in the, in the library. And my, what I'm doing is I'm adding about $10,000 of cameras every year okay. to, to the interior of the, of the main branch and we'll, we'll get to the outside branches as we can. Um, so we, we have, a, uh, I don't know how many cameras we have at this point, but we have maybe 20 or 25 cameras Excellent. located inside the library that we have, that, that we have access to at, at uh, the service desks and Keith's office and we are wiring to have access in the administration area as well. And we can, we can review those footage. Um, we've actually ha helped the police out with, with one of our cameras that we have focuses on Main Street. We've actually identified uh, our robbery suspects from that camera. So it's a, it, they're, they're really working out well and I'm a firm believer of, of more cameras, the better. Excellent. We also have active, active trainer shooting, active shooter training every year. We've had our second one since I've been here, and we're currently working on an emergency procedure plan with the with the uh, with the uh, public sa or the safety committee, health and safety committee. So we're putting that together as we speak. We're hoping to have that done in draft form for the trustees to approve in September. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you for all that you do. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Sullivan. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Engel. Good Thanks evening, Councilor. I'm looking at page 163. 
under library goods and services. Mm -hmm. And the first item is office supplies. Last year we approved $6,632 for office supplies. But I, I understand that $12,002 were spent. Yes. What did we miss? What did we miss in uh, gauging the- There's So much more spent. Um, the cost of supplies is, has ticked up a little bit. Um, I've added new, new printing services at all the branches. All the branches now have active real printers. Um, I've added faxing and, um, and scanning services. So we've upticked our services a little bit and we're, we're spending more on supplies like paper, to, put, to be quite honest with you. Are we spending $12,000 more? Um, you know, I'd have to drill into that a little bit more, but I do know that, that since I've been here, we do spend, t typically spend more on supplies for promotion and, and, it, and we're doing a lot more events programming than, mm -hmm. than I think we've ever done in the library. So that adds to more promotion and more promotional materials. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And then last year, oh, I'm not finished yet. <laughs> um, last year on the 2019 Brockton Public Library cover sheet, it noted that there were three vacancies on the trustees. Yes. Have those vacancies been filled? Absolutely. So it's the board is complete now. The board is complete, we have nine members. And does the board have written rules and regulations? They, they are, I know you've asked me that, and I did find them online under the city ordinances. And I'm sorry I didn't get back to you. I, I had a, a vacation teched in here, so. I, I <laughs> saw ordinances, but I didn't see rules and regulations. Okay, maybe I'll have to look again, or maybe I'll have to clarify with, with you and Mark um, exactly what the rules and regulations you're looking for are. Mr. Lindy, are there written rules and regulations for the Board of Trustees? They're in the ordinance. Pardon me? They're in the ordinance. So it's limited to what's in the ordinance? Yes. It's not called rules and regulations, though. No, it's it, called the ordinance. Yes, it's, it's right in the city ordinances, and it's something that I've thought for a long time that we should update and look at. And now that we have a full board, it was kind of a challenge with a smaller board and having a difficult time getting quorum. But now that we have a full, very diverse, very active board, that's something we're going to have on the agenda for September. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor, Councilor Powell. Uh, Mr. Engel, I just have one procedural uh, question. Of course. Th there is an ordinance that says that no board or commission should meet on the same evening as a regular city council meeting. Yes. The only organization in the city that doesn't follow that is the library trustees. And I'm told that out of all of the different dates within the the month that no one is willing mm -hmm. to change. Now, you know what, knock yourself out. I don't particularly care, but the only thing is it opens up others to say, well, you know, if the library trustees can avoid the ordinance, then, then we can. So I would just ask people, is there, you know, do you want to comply with the ordinance or don't you? Because what it means is for some counselors, and I know Councilor Borgat and others do like to go over mm -hmm. to the library trustees meeting, now that we meet at seven o'clock, they really are torn between two different commitments. So maybe, uh, you know, maybe you can talk that over and find out if there isn't some resolution to it. It's just, it, it, it doesn't seem to be an insurmountable task to meet on a finance committee night. All right. You know? I'm, I'm happy to, to, I'm sure Mark and- uh, Why don't we ask the uh, chair of the board, if, you, if the council's <laughs> don't, uh, if there's no uh, objections. Uh, mm -hmm. We thought we had it all set until the meeting went from both meetings, FinCom and Council, went to seven o'clock. You and I had had a discussion at one point about we were gonna try to hold all of those meetings when you had an eight o'clock meeting and it was a 6.30 library board meeting. Now that they're both seven and seven, it's kind of difficult to do that. We did pull the trustees and we asked people and when they were appointed to the board, they had the understanding that they were appointed to the board and they were gonna be available on Monday nights. I tried multiple times to move the meeting to other nights and that was gonna cause us lack of a quorum. Also plus, we were down the three trustees. I'll put it back on the agenda again for September and see if we can get a change. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, you, you could meet on the first and third Mondays. It, I think the ordinance, as I understand Council. it, and some people have been here longer than I have, it only applies to Council. regular city council okay meetings. so we have moved to the first monday of the month 
That's what we have done in re recently. Okay. Okay. This particular month, we have the 17th, which I think is, is it FinCom or Council this month? FinCom. FinCom. So this month, it's because we were doing the director's evaluation, but we have been cognizant to that. And one of our newest members, uh, Phyllis Ellis, who's the president of the NAACP, she meets on the second and fourth Monday of the month for her board. So it's a little schedule juggling, but we're, we're going to endeavor to be on the first Monday of the month. I would love to be away from Mondays because sometimes Monday holidays impact the trustee schedule and then it makes it even more complicated. But I'll bring it, I'll put it back on the agenda for September. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure if the other boards and commissions have found a resolution, you folks can. So yep. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Councilor Thawell. Uh, anyone else? Hearing none, sir, you are dismissed. And keep up the good work. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Item number. The next item. <laughs> Council on Aging, Janice B. Fitzgerald, Director. Mrs. Fitzgerald, welcome. Good evening, all. Did you take the new elevator? I'm sorry? Did you take the new elevator up here? I did, yep. And you liked it? Mm, I'm okay with it. All right, thank you. <laughs> Go right ahead. I'm not a fan of any elevator, but that one wasn't too bad. <laughs> uh, so good evening, I have my mission statement. Um, the Brockton Council on Aging, a branch of city government, is mandated to assess the needs and provide programs and services to seniors in the community and strives to improve their quality of life. The Council on Aging offers through its staff and volunteers easy access to an array of general programs, information, and socialization opportunities to senior, seniors aged 60 years and older. Um, with all that being said, I just want to say we had a great year. I have to send thanks and kudos to my very hardworking staff and volunteers. We've welcomed uh, new members daily. And we are noticing, or we have noticed, but especially this year, the needs of our elders and family members in this community are, are growing. Um, so with all that being said, I'll take any questions. Uh, Councilors, the floor is open. Come on, you got to ask at least one question. Uh, I have I'm a question. Can I ask a question? Go right ahead. Does anyone here watch Jeopardy? Yes. <laughs> okay, so James, he's out. Oh. James lost. James lost. So. Uh -uh. That's too bad. Point of information: it leaked out over the weekend. <laughs> oh, it did. Oh, well, I was getting a text while I was sitting here. I was like, oh, no. Point of information, the Bruins just dropped the puck right now at 820. <laughs> 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 uh, move on, move on. Let's go. <laughs> I have a quick question for you. Um, I know you're looking for a part-time driver. Mm -hmm. How did you guys come up with $12 an hour? You know the minimum wage in Massachusetts now is $12, right? Have you been able to fill that position at $12? So the position was $12.50, and... Minimum wage is $12 an hour. Um, and after speaking to other COAs, they're paying just about that for a part-time per diem driver. And we actually have hired three. Oh, you have? S yep. Okay. So um, we were waiting to get the drivers hired, and we will be getting the van soon. Okay. Uh, Looks like you're out of luck. I'm out of luck. <laughs> 12 bucks, you know, it's not bad. <laughs> Thank you for all that you do. Oh, you got a question? Sure. Council Borgard. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Um, did you buy the van, lease it? How did, how did you come across this and the funding for it? Yeah. Yep, so it was hard to get the funding for the van. It um, cost us a dollar <laughs> through Brockton Area Transit. We've purchased this. Oh, it's a wonderful. used vehicle. Okay, yep. all right. I had a feeling it was something like that. Great. And so am I to understand that these different drivers can just, when they're available, they're available, and that's how that'll play out? Yep. That's terrific. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Thank Good you. Good luck. Okay, thank you. Let's go. Council Good Good go. Thank you. Well, I guess there are questions, huh? Good evening, Ms. Fitzgerald. Hi. Nice Hi. to see you. Um, I, I saw on page 101, you have several staff members who are paid from an EOEA grant. Can you just give me an idea of the total for the three of them? I know two are part-time. And one is your program activities coordinator. I don't know what 
page you're referring to. I don't have a book, but I can oh. go by what I have here. One, 101, page 101. It lists staff paid from non-general fund revenue. The program right. activities coordinator. Then your part-time yep. shine person and your part-time outreach person. Yep. I, I'm just wondering what is the total that is be between the three of them? So it is, let me just do a rough, rough calculation here. Okay. I don't think that's right because it wouldn't add up to what I have here through the grant. So the calculations I have here would be probably about 75,000 total for three employees. Okay, okay, thank you. And also, in last year's write-up, okay, um, it talked about how you were, you were participating in the Brockton Project Lifesavers Program, um, and it's sponsored by the Council on Aging and the SALT Committee. Are you still doing that? So actually that program was started many, many, many years ago by the SALT Triad Committee from the Brockton Council on Aging. Mm -hmm. So that group raises the funds for the program and the program is free to seniors in the Brockton community. That's right. So it's still ongoing? Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank okay. You, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I'm just going to make a comment that my light switch costs more than your van that I bought over there. <laughs> so I would have bought the van if I knew it was a dollar. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Madam Fitzgerald, thank you for all that you do and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chairman, Chris. if I could, uh, Janice, isn't June the um, Elder Abuse Awareness yes. Month? Yes. And it's going to be the walk again? Yep. I think it's the 12th or 13th. I, yeah. It's a Thursday. Okay. Mm -hmm. It'll be at noon. Um, every year the numbers grow and grow. I think we had over 100 and something folks last year. Excellent. Yep. We'll be there. I'll make Thank sure you get the date. Please do. Thank you. Yep. Have Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, and have a good night. You too. Madam Clerk, the next item, please. Board of Health, Louis E. Tartaglia, Jr., Executive Director. Monsieur Tartaglia, bienvenue. Hello, Councilors. <laughs> How are you today? Um, Department mission to enforce the laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the laws and the ordinances of the city of Brockton to protect the health and well-being of its residents and the general public. Any questions for the executive director of the Board of Health? Council Sullivan. I don't have any questions, but I do want to thank Mr. Tataglia. I mean, every time I reach out to him and his, and his staff when uh, constituents call, uh, Luke gets back like that and, and the issues resolved. So thank you very much for all that you do and your staff as well, Mr. Thank Tadegli. you, Council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Sullivan. Uh, Council DeCastro. Uh, Council Borgat, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, um, Mr. Todd Taglia. I just want to emphasize that uh, people, you know, not always sure where to call for certain things and um, Mr. Tark Taglia has his mission statement here and all the services they provide there lengthly. And uh, two of them that I want to highlight here is um, that they respond to housing and emergency complaints and they try to protect the residents from the city from health hazards and also respond to rubbish, nuisance, junk vehicles, unsafe, unsecured, abandoned buildings. And um, so that's a, a, what we call code enforcement, and we appreciate that. And just off topic for one minute here, uh, we've been reading and hearing a lot about the measles epidemic popping up in various areas. Are we to be concerned here in our community? Uh, yes, very, well, very much concerned. Uh, right now, we have no cases in the city of Brockton. In fact, we thought we had one today, but uh, okay. the person was from the Bridgewaters and not from Brockton. Uh, we're keeping a close eye on that and then take the direction from the uh, Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you, Councilor. Okay. Councilor McCaskill. Yes, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Tartaglia. Thank Good you evening, for being here. I noticed from the list that you gave us of employees that you currently don't have an animal inspector? Um, 
I have no anim have had no animal inspector since the beginning of the year. Plus, I just lost a code enforcement inspector. Uh -oh. And both of these are due to the residency requirements. Oh. Are you advertising for the animal inspector? Four times. Have you? Yep. Without luck? Well, um, we've had some applicants that, you know, I'm just, I don't think they have the experience. Okay. Okay. Um, wow, that's a shame. Those are important positions. Yes, very important. And I would echo my colleague every time I call your office. People are courteous to me, and I always ask, can you investigate this and get back to me? I always receive a return call telling me what happens, and I'm very grateful because that way I can let the constituent who brought the issue to my attention know what's going on. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Councilor Nicastro. Councilor Fowler. Good evening, Lou. Uh, Good a evening. couple of quick questions on a topic that uh, apparently is coming to the forefront, and that is the marijuana licensing. Are, are you folks having to go through any training? Uh, are there any issues regarding compliance that will involve the local Board of Health? Um, any educational outreach? Uh, bring us up to date a little bit on whether you'll be involved with that, the Board will be involved with it or not. Um, right now, as far as I can see, um, we have no how do you want to say it? We have no import into the law. Uh, we do not permit the uh, marijuana establishments. Um, there is a statement, I believe, in the, in the city's ordinance as far as noise or complaints as far as that's concerned, but uh, I don't see a problem there. And the other thing is the state law requires that we do an inspection up there like once a year uh, for the cleanliness of the establishment. Other than that, um, I don't see any enforcement right now by the uh, Board of Health inspectors. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Councilor Falwell. Anything else for, the, uh, for Mr. Tataglia? Thank you very much. Thank you. Good work, and you're looking great, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, uh, number seven. Park Commission, Timothy W. Carpenter, Superintendent. Mr. Carpenter. Good evening, Councilors. Uh, um, the City of Brockton Parks Department is governed by the Parks Commission. We oversee and maintain approximately 40 parks uh, comprising 1,100 acres of recreational and open space. This includes passive parks, ball fields, soccer fields, basketball, tennis, volleyball courts, several memorials, two municipal pools, DW Field Golf Course, as well as the Jewel of the City, uh, DW Field Park. Our mission is to prov provide safe, clean, and beautiful parks, green spaces, and recreational facilities for the community, as well as to provide opportunities for re relaxation, learning, socialization, and to promote personal growth. The department endeavors to do these through developing and managing accessible park facilities, supporting a broad range of leisure and outdoor activities, effectively planning for future needs of Brockton residents, continually striving to improve existing facilities while seeking opportunities for future development, creating and maintaining partnerships with other departments and community members to improve the quality of all the parks, manage and promote a quality golf facility and programs at a good value for participants of all age levels and skills. I would also like to take this time, excuse me, to thank the employees of the park department, both assigned to the parks and to those assigned to DW Field Golf Course. Both divisions have done yeoman's work to provide excellent conditions throughout this past year. I would also like to thank Renee Brown uh, for all she does in mm -hmm. keeping the office organized and, and as well as myself. Uh, I would also be remiss if I didn't mention that the um, employees of the Public Properties Division uh, do terrific work in maintaining the pools for uh, the city. I am uh, open to any questions. Uh, Council Cruz. Thank you. Actually, my first question, I think, is for Mr. Clarkson. 
Mr. Clarkson. Now, see, back you, when you first you got have, here, you, you, you started showing up once in a while. Nobody would ask you any questions. Mm -hmm. I knew this was coming, so. I don't know. <laughs> Happy to be here. You, um, in our budget book, Mr. Clarkson, you have Parks and Recreation under Enterprise Funds. Oh, yeah. But the entire department's not an Enterprise Fund, I don't believe, is it? Recreation, it's way down. No. So th there is a portion of it that is. There's approximately a million dollars. Uh, find the exact amount. Approximately a million dollars of general fund revenue that's used right. to support the operation. Okay, that's what I thought because it's like I say, it's in this, it's in your tab that's enterprise funds, but we don't. Yeah. We we don't do an entire. Uh, it it's sort of a hybrid, to be honest with you. Uh, so a portion well, of it. But an enterprise fund is an actual fund, dollars in, dollars out. Yes, but. Uh, but uh, let me rephrase. It's not a revolving fund. No. And it's not an enterprise fund as far as w we, we budget money f for the department above and beyond what comes in from the, from the golf course. That's correct. You actually could do that technically with an enterprise. <clears throat> so a portion of this is treated as an enterprise primarily through the golf, but we then subsidize that with a, about a million dollars through the general fund but for the we recreation. don't do it. The, the, the funds that come in from the golf course actually go into the general fund, correct? Not all of them, no. No, they don't. They go to the they they go to the parks and recreation fund. So there's actually there's an enterprise fund related to this operation that's separately audited on an annual basis. Uh, you'll see uh, under the revenue side where we showed the, uh, the retained earnings for each of the enterprises. Yep. And there's actually a separate accounting by the Department of Revenue for this operation. But I said, as I said, it's sort of a hybrid yep. because the tradition here has been to fund the total operation, golf and parks and recreation, through a general fund appropriation. Through Not to further complicate things, but when, when an enterprise fund in general, when its revenues don't meet uh, its expenses, the general fund is required to, to subsidize. Which we have had to do quite often with the water department and the sewer department because we've been mm. against doing uh, the proper uh, proper funding on that. That is correct. In, uh, increase rate increases, but uh, but the entire how much? Well, let me ask. What do we bring in from the golf course, and what do we spend on the entire parks and recreation? So which is what we're looking at. I mean. So the entire budget is uh, 980. Page 240, is that correct? 240 and 241. Yeah, Those are. Uh, let, let me just check and make sure I have the right accounting here, so I don't sort of give you the proper answer. Mm -hmm. If you look on page 245. Yep. Yeah, that's probably the best. Okay. Uh, yeah. Weighted. So, as I said, it was approximately a million dollars, uh, and, and so it, the way this is typically operated, the appropriating body, which of course is the, the council, recognizes that public recreation is important enough that it deserves a general fund subsidy over and above what's operated through this operation. Right. I just wanted to... Uh, you know, and again, this is our first year with you being here, and uh, there are going to be some things okay. certainly different done differently than when Mr. Connor was here. The the overall budget is three million two fifty seven. Correct. And some change. Mm -hmm. And about what we bring in, do we bring in from the golf course? Tim, you may know b better. Uh, were you looking for fiscal year or? Yeah, I mean, how much of that three million two? Like a million. Comes from the golf course. So. So the budget um, number actually in the end is 2.2 million 2, 270,000, if I'm not mistaken. Is what we fund, so it's about a million dollars we're getting from the golf course. Right. So, um, you know, if you want to go by golf season, um, mm -hmm. 2017, obviously it was our best ever. Um, the golf course did a million 8,205. Uh, Last year, we were 965,512. 
Uh, so if you want to go by fiscal year, fiscal 17, it was $898,645. Uh, fiscal 18, it was $1,018,051. Uh, so far, fiscal 19, we are at $840,852. But so that's only through June 2nd. Essentially, we're bringing in a million dollars or so from the course. Uh, yes, I would like to, to say. And by the way, I continue to get rave, rave reviews about the, the quality of the golf course right now compared to private courses, compared to anything in the area. So um, kudos to you and your staff. And I see that you, you're advertising actually right now for a second greenskeeper, correctly? Uh, we are looking for a greenskeeper, yes, sir. So you have one and they'll this, be- If this budget passes, sir. If this budget passes, yes. Yeah, but that's an investment in, in what we're doing up there because as golf has actually slowed down in the air, not in the area, in the country, and we're getting more play because it's in such great shape up there, so. Correct, so our, our rounds were up 2.76%. Uh, um, where the nationwide average was down 1.7% and the state average was down 0.8%. Great, thank you. Thank you for that information. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Kluz. Council Potwell, then followed yes. by Sullivan. Uh, good evening, Mr. Capito. I have one quick question and it's on page 245. It says, Golf Pro from RE, it was 42.189 in 2019 and it's jumped up to 132.410. Can you uh, just elaborate on that? Okay, um, yes, so it's, it's actually, um, you'll see it's also combined with item 660-63187, um, Golf Pro Contract Services. So your end total um, is at approximately 182,500. Uh, so we pay the um, contractor at the pro shop on a percentage basis. Um, and this year we've moved to um, a flat fee between zero and 850,000. And then it's uh, an additional percentage over that. And so um, figuring we're going to do a million dollars um, at the average percentage, it would be about $180,000. That would be due to the contractor. But it looks like he's gonna get 132,410 total. Uh, it, it really depends on the amount of play at the golf course, um, but the possibility, so the Golf Pro contract services, you, that line item there, so the line item has been split essentially. So the line item could reflect 182,500. So it's, so it'll be the 132,410 plus the 42,189? Am I? Uh, plus the, here? No, sir, the $50,090 in Golf Pro contract services. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. See it? <laughs> Big deal. Okay, 50,090, 132,410. So basically, you're just increasing the contractual amount you're providing to him based on the volume of rounds that are played. Correct, and the additional services that he is now providing. Okay, now if, and I certainly don't want to be negative, but it, do we adjust it downward if necessary, or? Well, again, it is based on the usage of the golf course. So if he doesn't do his job in marketing the golf no. course and in bringing in people, then that, that effectively uh, oh, accounts for a loss to his bottom line. Okay. It's no, an no, encouragement to get yeah. him to get as many people through that door <laughs> and more importantly, off the golf course as quickly as possible. I mean, a golf course has uh, it has a finite amount of space. It's based on, you know, the size of the golf course and the hours of daylight. The faster you can get people through the golf course, the more people you can get on it. That is one of the increased responsibilities that led to, uh, a, you know, on the contractor in the pro shop that led to this um, adjustment in the percentage basis of how he's paid. Okay, that, that's a reasonable way to get him to uh, increase. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Council Sol uh, Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Coppino, good evening. Good evening. Um, I, first of all, I just want to thank you, Tim, because every time I send you emails or call you, um, and, it, and it ranges, right? I think my most recent was broken wood bleachers 
have one of the ball fields, but it could be poison ivy or cutting the grass, the fields. You do it and, and, and your staff does it really quickly uh, and it really benefits the kids of Brockton. So I wanna thank you. But I also again wanna publicly uh, thank you and everybody associated with the, uh, the first tee program, which was a free golf camp for mm -hmm. residents, kids in the city of Brockton for April vacation. My three kids participated. It was an awesome thing. Tim Cruz just said it, that's a great golf course. It's, it really is an asset that the city of Brockton has. So kudos to you on that. And then my, my other thing, I just wanted to publicly state again, and I've been asking the mayor, and we did work in collaboration with the schools this year. Um, for those that are familiar with West Middle School, I still call it West Junior High, but for years, the polls, uh, you know, they're almost like telephone poles, but back in the 70s, we used to play there at night, right? They're the big lights that would light up the field. Those things haven't worked in 30 or 40 years. Um, last year when I was coaching ball, and again this year, um, it was a real hindrance and a danger for the kids. Splinters, one of the poles fell off in a heavy wind, fell right down, thank God nobody was there. Um, but Mayor Carpenter and I spoke about this, and, and thanks to you, uh, April vacation, almost all of them were severed and taken down. National Grid uh, didn't want to help us in any way on that, so thank you for that. Uh, I'll say that again, National Grid did not want to help us on any of that. Um, I guess they're dealing with, you know, venting the, the manholes. Um, but, but again, I, I asked you before this public hearing, um, baseball season ends this week. Some of the parents, and I'm coaching again, some of the parents have asked why are the polls, you know, laid across? And you explained to me why, but publicly, if you could just explain it, because if you drove up there today, you would see the polls are not up. Well, there's a couple in the backfield near Thorny Lee, yep. but there's some right on the ground. Could you just explain so, why that is and when they're gonna be gone? So the ones that are, are were standing uh, just before, prior to or during April vacation, yep. those ones should be removed here shortly. Um, they will be utilized uh, in another department in the city uh, just to store pipe on. Uh, the remaining two, uh, as you'll notice, we, we did a fair amount of damage to the middle of the field uh, in an attempt to get to those two at the far side of the field. Um, conditions were just too soft. I pushed it and uh, our large crane got stuck so as soon as I'm confident, we're not gonna do any more damage, uh, we will get the crane back and remove those last two poles. So probably within a month's, month's time? I would say just about, yes. Okay, thank you again for that. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor Sullivan, Councilor Borgard. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Carpenter, for being here. And um, I'm impressed with uh, what your team does, especially Renee. And uh, I think it's really important for people to know that yes, they can have, you know, I would say use a playground for an event, use uh, Salisbury Park or what have you, and they need to go through a proper procedure. Maybe you can highlight that a little bit. Uh, so yes, um, any organized event at any one of the parks does require a permit. Um, the permit applications, whether it's for an athletic event or whether it's for a family gathering or a picnic, um, both those applications are available on the Parks Department section of the city website. Um, download them, print them out, uh, fill them out, return them to me. Permits will be issued um, after review. Um, there is a $25 application fee associated with that, payable only by money order, no cash, no personal checks, no credit cards. All right, thank you very much for that. And um, if, if you don't mind, um, maybe talking a little bit about any plans for spiffing up uh, DW Field Park. It seems that uh, the wind and the old trees, et cetera. And I know you've had Appalachian groups and et cetera, the trail groups over the years. Are we gonna see anybody like that? Uh, so we have applied for a couple of grants to hopefully help us out uh, improving some of the parks, uh, including the trails uh, within the park. Um, some additional um, informational kiosks um, spread out more, more throughout the park, providing a map, um, not only a large map, but also individual maps that people could bring with them through the park. Um, working currently actually with an Eagle Scout to provide a couple of those. Um, so we are doing some things to try and um, address not only some of the aging infrastructure, but um, easing some of the use of the park. Thank you very much, and thank you for all you do, and your team, too. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Isaac, Isaac, followed by Natasha. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Carpenter. Evening. Thank you for being here, and I'm going to thank you and Renee, and I can always say that any time I've called your office, you've been very prompt, and I appreciate it. Um, have we thought, I, I thought in the past we've talked about 
possibly uh, using the golf course with like tent rentals for special events. Is that, I, for some reason I have a feeling, I remember speaking about it, but then it seems to have died out. So but constituents have asked me. So, so we, we used to have a tent there. Um, Mm -hmm. And that was predominantly for um, golf outings uh, to have their banquets afterwards. Uh, the current vendor that is um, running the lunchroom uh, is from Tommy Doyle Sidelines, uh, which has a large banquet facility down there. So we tried to save a little bit of money this year and not rent the tent. Um, the clubhouse itself is not really equipped for private banquets, um, you know, weddings, that kind of thing. Um, and space is very tight up there, obviously. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, I'd love to be able to build a nice big deck on the side of the, the building. Um, someday, hopefully before I retire, we will. Uh, and that should take care of some of that, uh, that, that overflow from events. Okay, because I, there is a need for it. There was a call. So that's um, maybe that's something we can look at down the line. Um, the other question I had, I know Councillor Sullivan mentioned the golf camp, and I know in the past years my kids have participated. Do you have one planned for the summer? And if so, if we can tell people at home. Yep, so there will be another first tee program again this year. Um, in conjunction, we're also running um, what's called the Junior PGA. Um, anyway, let me get back to the first tee. First tee, you can sign up through um, Mass Golf Association. So you go down to the MGA website, um, and you'll be able to pick your location and sign up through that. Uh, is it, the funding for that program is provided through the Mass Golf Association. Um, we've also have established a junior PGA team uh, for both boys and girls. Uh, it's actually combined, it's based on age. Um, golf experience is not necessarily required, but it does help and it provides sort of a team concept to golf. So it's not so much of an individual thing, you get jerseys, um, it's kind of a lot of fun. That program's actually just started up. Just started now? Yep. Okay. And these are, they're free of charge for residents, The, the first tee for residents is. is. Yes. Okay. Uh, and uh, residents can get information on the city website or Correct. the... Uh, you can go, you can get to the DW Field Golf Course, either going to dwfieldgolfcourse.com okay. or through the city website. We'll link you there. Okay. Very good. And lastly, I would just like to thank you. I see that the built facilities building on Oak Street finally got painted. It looks nice, so thank you. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor, Councilor Nikesh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's always good to see you, Mr. Carpenter, and you're always very responsive to me and my word for issues and questions. I think this question is more for Mr. Clarkson. Um, and, and this is my question. Um, the golf course is different than everything else that the Parks Department addresses because it's something that brings in money. And also it's something that has a lot of expenses, a lot of additional expenses to it. It has a vendor selling food in the lunchroom and stuff. I would love to see a balance sheet on the golf course so that we could have a, a true idea of what goes in and what comes out. Is that possible? Sure, of, of course. And, and I, I was mentioning before, uh, in response to the questions from Councillor Cruz, the finances are treated differently because recreation and golf are all under one umbrella, but financially, uh, there is a portion of it that acts as an enterprise. But we certainly uh, could separate that out and provide an analysis for you of how much that 850,000 to a million dollars in golf revenue supports the golf operation. Is that the question you're asking? Uh, it is, yeah, yes. Sure, of course. And I know that Mr. Carpenter puts a lot of effort and his team do as well, does, into maintaining the grass. I've heard him speak, it's like a labor of love on improving <laughs> the place and the different holes and what he's done over the years. I would just be interested to know what has this, what, are, what has the city invested in it and what kind of a return are we getting? Sure, happy to put that together for okay. you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carpenter. Thank you. Are you uh, all set there, Councillor? Yes, I am, thank you. No, uh, no further questions, uh, Mr. Carpenter. I guess you need to stay put for the next item. Cemetery, Timothy W. Carpenter, Superintendent. Just a moment. Uh, 
Uh, good evening again, counselors. Uh, the City of Brockton Cemetery Department is governed by the uh, Cemetery Board of Trustees. We maintain and manicure uh, 10 public cemeteries within the city, um, with the Melrose, the Coesit, and the Union being the only active burial sites. Our mission is to provide memorialization uh, for the deceased in a place of beauty and solace, giving comfort to families and individuals by meeting final needs in coordination <coughs> with funeral directors. It is our goal in the remembrance of these lives and deeds of the men and women that have preceded us to maintain permanent records for those whose earthly remains we have been entrusted. We preserve and strengthen our assets, the grounds and infrastructure so that it can continue to share its rich history, artistic treasures, and beautiful landscape with the community. We perpetuate the activities, the active cemeteries by offering affordable options that will serve the public while conserving land and protecting the character of the landscape. I'd also like to take this time to thank the employees of the cemetery department for their hard work over the past year. We were able to perform 234 burials to date this fiscal year, and it is only through their hard work and dedication that this is possible while still performing the, the duties of perpetual care. We have also been able to update and complete all the data entry uh, for the Melrose Cemetery and most of Coesit Cemetery as well as many of the outside cemeteries. Um, this effort is in no small part due to <coughs> Maureen um, who staffs the office. I would also like to thank all those departments uh, including the um, Veterans Association and the Compensated Work Therapy Program for their help in preparing the grounds for what I feel was another successful Memorial Day. With that, I am open to any questions. Thank you, Mr. Carpenter. I know nobody wants to talk about cemeteries because, um, mm. mm -hmm. uh, Councillor Derencourt. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, <clears throat> good to see you, Mr. Carpenter. Um, last year, uh, I believe you and I spoke and we got to a few calls that I got uh, about a few family that would like to uh, bury some people, but unfortunately, according to what you stated back then, uh, there was an issue and we got to not able to bury more than one person during winter times. And I think the council uh, supported um, the line item to give you money to purchase that, uh, that piece of um, utility. Did you buy it? We did, um, and I would like to thank the council for that very much. It was an incredibly effective piece of equipment. Um, I'm happy to say that we didn't have any situations as we had uh, two years ago. Um, we were able to, in the winter time when the mm -hmm. frost had set in deep into the ground, we were able to quickly, efficiently, Chloe? very safely um, with that particular piece of equipment, open up the ground uh, for burials. So as we speak, I mean, it doesn't matter um, how tough uh, the winter might be, you will be able to actually bury at least, you know, more than one person. So we can count on that. That, that is absolutely our goal, yes. Okay, so I think, um, I forgot the name of the person that reached out to me. That's probably outside of your, um, <coughs> of your purview, but I got a call from someone and we got to, um, somebody that that bury someone next to his family but also bring a cross and i think according to the cemetery policy i believe this was in mel was um nobody is allowed to actually bring their own cross if it's not well maintained by an organization itself so i think that person actually built it himself and then go there and then put it it was kind of like something pretty uh, pretty tough and we got to some of your colleagues um, at that Melrose Cemetery. Did you guys resolve this problem or just let it go? Uh, I believe so. I mean, we, we, we didn't dispose of anything. Um, you know, <coughs> all of our, all the cemetery rules are available again on the cemetery department's website. Uh, everyone who buys a plot is, is receives a, a, a copy of those rules. Um, and again, they're, they're are available on the cemetery website. Yeah, through you to the, um, to the members, Mr. President. The reason I'm bringing this is the fact that I think you know, according to the Brockton Cemetery policies, no one is allowed to actually build their own cross at their house and then come to the cemetery and put it. And the issue that I think you guys, um, you know, had up there was someone who actually built his own cross and then go to the end and put it. And I think one of your guy up there almost, you know, had a fight with the guy trying to explain <coughs> to him that he couldn't do it. So I got a call from that person, you know, I was trying to explain to him that I don't think you can do something like that. So I believe I reached out to some, someone in your office and I think that problem was yep. what's mm -hmm. up. So I'm saying this just in case to give you an idea of what it was because that person, I mean, I actually went there to see it. That person literally <laughs> built that thing and then put it there. Right. So I, and it ha I believe that was in the single double E section. 
uh, if I remember correctly. Um, and that's a flat marker only area. Mm -hmm. um, and so for maintenance purposes, um, it's difficult to have large adornments like that in this in a single flat marker area. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Councilor, Governor. Councilor Fowler. Yes, uh, a quick question, Tim. Uh, between park and cemetery, you have $59,492 in separation costs. Uh, with respect to cemetery, <coughs> you've got 12000 Is that an anticipated retirement and we're going to owe the person some buyback or? That would be if um, one of my employees were to retire, which I'm very confident he's not going to. He's um, not going to. Correct. Oh, I'm pretty confident. Okay. But you never know. You have to budget for that just in case. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yep. Council Cruz. Thank you. Just want to check some other years we've had this. Is your is the Board of Trustees full? Uh, they are. Correct. Yeah, no, that's yep. good. And um, how are we financially, have we got our fees to where we're competitive with the other cemeteries in the area and private? I mean, we were very low for a long time. Correct. So we are we are much closer. We are still the lowest service provider. Which uh, being a municipality, I get correct. that. But um, we've been encouraged by other surrounding cemeteries to raise our prices. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, but I think um, for for the services we provide, uh, you know, I think there's obviously there might be some possibilities, but I think we're 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 kind of where we need to be right now. Okay, and I actually, I wouldn't have thought of this, but uh, after what Councilman Castro asked about the parks, Mr. Claxton, could you arrange for us to get uh, the same kind of report on the cemetery, cemeteries, you know, how much comes in and how much, you know, what, what we're spending on them? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Councilor. Uh, anyone else? I would like to say that if we could hold off on raising cemetery fees for a few more years, I'd appreciate years. it. Uh, I was Sorry, thinking Councilor exactly the up. same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor uh, Nicastro, did you Thank want to you. have a follow-up? Thank you, Mr. Carpenter. On page 88, under cemetery personal services, non-overtime, toward the bottom of that section, you've got workman's compensation, and you were paying north of $50,000 a year for workman's compensation. And this year it's zeroed out, how come? Um, that person has, that employee is now uh, currently retired. Oh, that's terrific. Yes, it is. Great, <laughs> okay. And then closer to the bottom of that page under cemetery purchase of services, you've got a listing for other services. And by far it's the largest listing in that section. Yep. Um, last year we approved $25,000 it sounds like the cemetery spent 42.5. This year, the budget is for $30,000. So what kind of services are other services? Um, primarily, that line item is used to pay the, um, so we work with the VA, utilizing the Compensated Work Therapy Program, um, which provides veterans with employment. Um, and so with minimum wage going up, that's why you see the, the increase here, um, even though we pay a little slightly above minimum wage. Um, but it also has to do with the availability. Generally, we'll, we'll ask for uh, three individuals. Sometimes we can squeak out four in the fall, uh, depending on how much of that line item is left uh, to help with leaves. So generally speaking, we will run uh, that program or utilize that program from about April 1st to about December 1st. Okay. And it just helps a great, I mean, it's to have someone, when we have three or four burials in a day, two, three burials in a day, sure. to have someone, three or four individuals that are dedicated to mowing and trimming when you have 60,000 headstones just at the Melrose is an incredible help. It really is. Um, and those gentlemen do terrific work. Thank you, Mr. Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Cruz. Quick question. How many headstones did you say we have? Just at the Melrose, you're probably looking at, I mean, I think we have just shy of 40,000 buried there. So I think, you know, you're looking at close to 50,000 50, headstones. It's a lot of votes. <laughs> thank I you. I know how to get them. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Yanniri. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. President. Um, how we set, uh, Mr. Carpenter, with, with land? I mean, is there, do we still anticipate enlarging as we go on in the next year or two or three, or 
what's yes so as one of the deferred um, possible capital outlays uh, there is a request for six hundred and fifty thousand um, okay. dollars for this coming fiscal year we are quickly running out of room okay um, at the Melrose Cemetery okay um, so I would encourage and hopefully the council looks favorably upon that request um, we have um, we have picked a location within the Melrose um, okay. that seems to be the most fiscally um, it requires the least amount of input so it'll be you'll get the most bang for your buck mm -hmm. and are, are we uh, are we now in the in, in the situation where we're very on burying on top of doing one two three four are we still doing like no, we one, are two, still three? doing side by side you still okay so somebody wanted to buy six lots you just went six you go six you would go three on one side three on the other side three on the other side okay yep. okay i just wondered if that's what and, and there's only one last question i have is um i know there's one of the streets that um you have it um, blocked with um, a, a tree limb more or less uh, or trunk of a tree for a reason i would say and the only reason why i mention that is because i'm a I'm a little bit older. I'm the only one that knows where great, great grandma's buried, and I have to I have to walk a little bit further. But um, I know it's been that way for for a while. So is it is the reason to? So I apologize that you have to walk walk a little That's further. That's right. Counselor, I'm doing well with um, it. That particular area, we get multiple complaints about illicit activities. Okay. Um, and we've sort of worked in conjunction with the police department to try and restrict access to certain areas in the yep, back because, of the cemetery. Because that street right there, the backyards are right there, and there's the streets, and yeah. And I apologize, but that, that's what. No, I'm, it really is to restrict. One end the was area. opened up this year, so it was a little bit easier. But no, that was fine. I, I thought that was the problem. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Um, having no further questions, uh, Mr. Carpenter, you're uh, free to go. Thank you, Council. Enjoy your night. Number nine, Madam. Police, John Crowley, Chief. Chief, welcome. Good evening, I'd like to um, just by begin by thanking the hardworking men and women of the Brockton Police Department for the effort they put in every day in the protection of our life and property here in the city. And I have a... Um, brief mission statement prior. The police department's mission is to assist the residents and visitors to the city of Brockton in the protection of life and property to provide services and to promote a safe environment in the city. The department will continue to develop an implementation of a citywide community policing plan as we move forward. Thank you, sir. Uh, any questions for the police chief? Don't jump all at once. <laughs> Council Powell. Yeah, actually, I may have to uh, enlist Mr. Claxon or, if no one objects, Captain Williamson, because I, it, this is a budgetary question. And, uh, Without objection, any, you may, sir. We can tag team, certainly. That's it. Yeah, and Chief Crowley can, can stay if he wants. Team, uh, as I understand it, we have 17 recruits that will be going to the academy. Can you give us the the sequence of how many will be going when and anticipated graduation dates if all goes well? We have six presently in the Cambridge Police Academy. They started earlier in the month. Um, we have four scheduled to go to the new Cape Cod Academy um, beginning of next month, and seven are scheduled to go to Randolph in September. They've already booked and been accepted. So, so, so six when in May? Yes. Right. The reason I ask is that if, if I'm looking at page 189 correctly, and this is where Captain Williamson and uh, Mr. Claxon might come into play, it looks like we have 24 vacant positions. Um, some are caused by additional promotional opportunities, including a, a lieutenant and some sergeants, and some are you, the names of people who have retired. Uh, am I so far, am I correct? Uh, when I submitted this in February, there was 24. Okay. Uh, we did I'm sorry, you are correct, 24. My 24 apologies. 24 vacancies. 24. Uh, we've had two more since then. Okay. Which would be 26. Okay. And we're, like, like the chief said, we have uh, 18 that we are hiring or in the process of hiring right now. Okay. Uh, one already started. He was already academy trained. <coughs> four is uh, four, 
four, four are going to the Cape Cod uh, soon. Uh, there's another seven starting in September, and there was six. So after all these academy people start, we should have, we'll probably have eight more vacancies. Okay, here's where I'm going with this. And you, look, I don't want to call it padding, but every, every budget's got to have a little leeway, whether it's the schools, the police, the fire. But we have budgeted in this book for 24 uh, positions at 60779 per year, which is $1.459 million. Uh, obviously, we're paying the cadets less. I think we pay them around 42 grand for the for the five months they're in the in the police academy, and then some positions you're not probably going to be able to fill even in the next fiscal year because even if you start in January of 2020, they probably wouldn't be out until June of 2020. So I guess what I'm asking is, within these 25 lines here, if we were to actually plug in the figures that would be appropriate, uh, th 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 there'd be some cost savings which maybe could go to some other area per the mayor or could spawn additional police recruits. There, there would be some. Uh, those salaries are based on first year employees. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so by September we'll have 18 of these positions filled, and they'll be collecting these salaries. No, so they, but no, they'll only be collecting 42 grand because they'll only be cadets. Oh, that's 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 right. They, so they'll you be got collecting about a 20, their base salary. Yeah. So you got about so a the, 20. So the other salaries they won't collect until they get they sworn in after the academy, which yeah. will be about five six months after they and, start and, the academy. And eight of these positions won't even be filled. Right. Uh, on on paper here it's six. It's now eight. Yeah. Right. So I, I guess, Mr. Claxon, uh, you know, we're not going to do it tonight, but maybe between now and when we wrap up, could you take a look at this and you and Captain Williamson at least get back to me and tell me what what do we need to for an expenditure to do what we're planning to do? Get the 17 in the academy. They'll eventually come out in us in some month, but not over expend here when we might be able to squeeze out some money for three or four more additional positions, if that, if that makes any sense. So two different questions. Can we come up with that calculation? Uh, for sure. I think the practice here has been, and it is a very sound budgeting practice, which I support, is to budget for a full complement of officers knowing uh, I, even in smaller departments, uh, that there's always a rolling set of vacancies because of retirements and people that leave. Uh, what I would recommend is that the budget stay at its full complement. Uh, we've balanced the budget based on our projections of how much money the city needs to do its business. I'll share with you a document that we received just today from Standard & Poor's, our bond rating agency, who specifically noted that budgeting practices like this helped us maintain uh, that AA rating for some debt that will be issued in a, in a week or so. Uh, so we actually rely on uh, some of that money, unspent money, to help generate the free cash for the following year. So we were able to balance this year's budget on $14 million in free cash. We watch very closely of just uh, with the help of our financial analyst, Andrew Nocon, developed uh, a tool to allow us to track on a monthly basis both our revenues and expenses so that we make sure we maintain that robust generation of, of free cash. So I, I'd suggest that the, the overall discussion is a larger one about what our philosophy is on, on budgeting. And in order to maintain the ability to balance our budget every year, um, we rely on dynamics like this uh, to be able to do that. So uh, happy to produce those figures for you, but what I would respectfully ask is that we consider it as part of a larger discussion on our budgeting philosophy so that we don't wind up um, 
shortchanging ourselves and reducing our ability to balance next year's budget because that's been the practice. And, and you know what, I'm, I'm with you on free cash and I'm with you on uh, having a supplemental reserve fund, but if, if, we're, if in fact we're not going to have any reasonable likelihood of filling some positions, I mean, we're already, if we're at 26 now, we've got 17 in the academy. Let's say you just take care of those 17, leave this the way it is. Those other nine, I mean, you could always come in for a supplemental appropriation, but those other nine are just, there's an appropriation hanging out there that could be used for something. And it, basically what it is, and I'll let some of my colleagues comment, we have an excellent department, but we're getting killed by the residents who, who they want more traffic enforcement. They want mm -hmm. more rapid response to incidents. They want someone to be out roaming around when they're allowed parties. They want fireworks addressed during the 3rd, 4th, and 5th of July. And we don't run the day-to-day -day operations of any city department, nor should we, but we need to pass on to you and to the chief and to the mayor that this is what we're hearing, and it's all over the city. It's, I, I go to all the different ward meetings, and the mm -hmm. message is consistently the same. So I'd like to just work with you and leave what you need in there, but extract what, what we don't need, which we probably won't spend, we won't get through recruiting and get more people into the academy uh, and, and use that money for other reasons, whether it's to have the mayor use it for more cruisers. I know he's got some, but, or, or three or four more officers. I, I guess that's, that's my philosophy. And, uh, okay. and as I say, I'll let, uh, I'll let my colleagues speak for themselves. And then of course we've got separation cost projections and if these nine people leave during the the fiscal year, we're, we're going to be down even more people. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit worried that we're losing the war of attrition. And I wish we were in a position where we could send 25 to the academy and then know that eventually, as people left, mm -hmm. budgetarily we'd be all right. But uh, whatever you want to come up with, I'll certainly work with you. I know the council is right. very pro public safety. I, I am. and. Uh, um, I, I just don't want to leave money in the table that could be used for something very worthwhile. Understood. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Farwell. Uh, Council Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Chief. How are you? Good. Thank you. Uh, Chief, you know, f from my perspective, it's always safety first for the, for the men and women in blue. And um, I'm pleased to see under police capital outlay the vehicles. Yes. We've talked about it for years, Chief. You know, they're old cars, high mileage. Um, you had actually requested 200 grand. The mayor actually gave you 250 or recommended 250, um, which is which is a good thing. How many new vehicles would that be able to? Because we would we lease them or would we purchase them? We'll purchase them. Um, our, the person in charge of our fleet um, doesn't recommend leasing because of they're used 24 hours a day. The cost of repair goes up as we use them, and the mileages. Yep. Um, so they find it better to purchase. So they're running about $50,000 a piece right now. And those are the, are they the SUVs? Yes. Okay. So we'd like five? Yes. That's great. That's great. Um, thank you for that. Um, one other, one other question. And then I just had a comment. Um, question was relative to it's on page 191. It's uh, overtime and you know, you and I, and as long as I've been on the council, I always question overtime for every department. Um, 1.19 was your request. 1.39 was the mayor's recommended. So it's a $200,000 increase from your recommendation to the mayor. And, I, and I'm just trying to figure out because again, you know, we've had some heated discussions in this chamber about overtime, not just for police, for everybody, but mm -hmm. um, you know, the police trying to fight crime and stop drugs, I get it, overtime's needed, but the mechanism is, you know, you, you budget X amount, you get to that amount, you come back and you look for more via no appropriation. Yeah. So I'm just trying to figure out when I crunch these numbers. I, I look to yours and it's comparable, pretty comparable to the previous, but why that extra 200 grand? Do you have an explanation on that? I don't, I can have uh, Mr. Clark. Troy, speak, do you know? But, you but know I would what? suggest that um, we're down so many bodies, our overtime costs are gonna go up substantially. Um, but I, I will heed to him. Yep. Okay. All right. Yeah. I get it. Troy, what, what, why is that 200,000? You know, 
uh, Council, is essentially the answer that the chief gave you. If you actually look at the 1390414 figure, uh, it matches it, last it year. It actually yeah, matches what? Yeah, to the penny, but I'm just, I'm just trying to look in. If this was done in February and the department had requested X and then Y comes back, I'm just trying to figure that out. So, a as I noted, uh, when the budgets were delivered to you last week, there was a memo that I, I prepared. And in that memo, I explained that. Uh, so, and when you look at this budget, uh, the department requested and mayor recommended, if there's a difference between those two lines, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that the, the mayor requested the increased spending. It may have been, and in this case was, the result of meeting with the departments from the time they submitted the budget to the time the final budget was, was generated. And it's a function uh, of the software of Munis that once you close out a portion of it, the, the nomenclature is the department requested and the mayor recommended. But in some of these cases, as a, the budget process was followed, and so when Chief Crowley submitted his original budget, we then have the opportunity to sit down with Karen Praval, our budget director, and Captain Williamson, and have some discussions about what their needs are. And it was through that process, actually, that the increased uh, recommendation was made for the overtime because of this, uh, uh, some of the dynamics we just discussed with Councilor Farwell. And so some we're going to see this throughout the next couple nights on other various departments. Yes. This type of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Not not in all, but in some cases there will be uh, budgets where when we had the opportunity, Karen and I, to sit down with the department head and understand their needs, uh, that 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 had changed. Okay. Uh, Chief, my last my last comment. We we have these quarterly council at large meetings. Yes. And, and you know that, and 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 you support that. Um, recently, uh, a, a resident constituent had brought to our attention, Gene, myself, Moses, and 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 when. Uh, Calvary Cemetery, private cemetery, St. Patrick's, you know, owns it, runs it, but there's a illicit activity uh, going on. Um, so I'm just trying to, uh, and I'm sure that the police are aware of that, but I'm just trying to bring to your attention some of the things that were brought to our attention is, is mind boggling that people would do this in a cemetery. So I just didn't know if maybe they could maybe increase patrols there, just do drive throughs to kick some of those yahoos out of there. Absolutely. Thank you, Chief. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Ianeri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Chief. How are you? Good evening, sir. Chief, when, I, when I'm looking at the, um, first, of, first of all, I, I, I want to thank you for being here, and I want to um, definitely commend our uh, men and women that are you know, keeping us safe every, uh, every moment every, and every minute that we're here as well. And um, I'm just going to make this quickly uh, a quick comment, but um, after a, a little bit of a tiff that occurred here in City Hall this past week, um, after seeing what I saw in the newspaper with a gentleman giving some people some trouble in the clerk's office, I think it's high time that we um, start to think about having a little bit of police presence here a little bit more in the course of the day for the safety of the customers and, and the safety of our people as well. So I hope you'll start to look at that. And I'm having a meeting with the mayor on Wednesday um, for my own benefit for things in my ward, but I'm gonna mention that to him as well. Um, and as the Dean of the Council and the past president, um, I was the one that got the officers here to be here as they are here this evening with us. And I think we need to start to take a look at that. I really do. I've had that. I've had people even mention that to me, you know, to me. They, right. They just, I, I, how can I say it? It's the society of today and, and we know what we're dealing with. And it's, it's scary. It, it really is. So, but in any case, looking at, um, when I look at the, the, uh, the budget book and I look um, in the employee list and I see the, um, the buyback, and, and, and when I see the amount of the buyback for, you know, officers, captains, lieutenants, sergeants, I, I mm -hmm. you know, I see quite a bit, and as we go down, I see quite a bit more, but then as I, as I flip to another page, which is like page 187, 188, I don't see as much of the employees receiving, and then when I get to page 189, uh, not many at all, I do see that these are, could be vacant positions, but I'm just trying to fathom what, what it is all about. And I know it comes out to the tune of about $300,000, um, 300488 to be truthful with you. Can, can you explain to me, or maybe if not, maybe Captain Williamson can, I don't need to be putting you on the spot, but if he can, uh, I, I'd just like to know what that's all about. Captain? Uh, you're talking about the buyback that was yeah. something that was added to uh, uh, 
uh, contracts for the patrol and supervisors, I believe, in the last contract. Okay. Uh, to be eligible to sell back time, you have to have at least 75 days in your account. I so see. newer employees, it's going to take time to it's get to that, for to be to, eligible. To get to be eligible for that. So okay. you have a lot of guys that are on 20 years that are eligible. Right. A lot of them are supervisors. Okay. So, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you can sell back 10 days. I see. Um, if you have 75 days in your account. That's so. how it works. Yes, this is this. This is something that goes into your deferred compensation plan. Okay. That's what you're it asking about, right? The buyback, the last category. Yeah, well, yeah. Obviously, I guess that's how I, I would. I would think that's how it would be. Yes. I, it only makes sense what you're saying to me. I believe. Yeah. The language is in the most recent contract. Contract. Uh, fiscal year 17 through 19. I got you. I got you. Okay. Yeah. And let me just ask you one other, one other question that um, that hit me. Um, because I'm looking at um, also the EDT um, people that we have, and I, gu I guess they receive clothing allowance. Is that obviously their contract? That's contractual. That's contractual as well. Yes. And, and, they, and they get that, e that's based upon each year, not uh, obviously I would say it must be each year. Is that right? I would think, yeah. Yes, it's, uh, I believe it's paid quarterly. Okay, but it's two. It comes out to two thousand dollars a year. Right, yeah, two thousand dollars. So each of them gets for, um, for that. It comes out to like thirty thousand dollars, I think, in the course of the year. Okay, all right, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chief, too, for your help as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor uh, Councillor Azek. Thank you. Um, good evening, Chief Crowley. A uh, quick question. A few years ago, we hired a crime analyst yes. and um, I know a few times you've tried to do resolves to get or to come before us um, and I know maybe we weren't ready to have her come before us but I was I attended one of the uh, safe street meetings that the DA has and I know he had a couple of his crime analysts a few months back and it was really interesting information good information I think the residents should be that we could share with residents is this are we ready to have our crime analysts come before us or um, I, I I believe it could happen if we know ahead of time what kind of questions you'd be wanting to ask her um, sure I mean it, it would be she, so numbers she and what you statistics. want sure and I think that people at home want to hear that and that was one of the reasons I know we were advocating to get a crime analyst so we could share these statistics with people at home so um, whether she just provides the data or she herself comes I okay. we can discuss so as long as she knows ahead of time what the questions are that's something or or you're asking me to get the questions and somebody else can come in with the data or yeah provided I, you know, I don't I, she's a civilian employee so okay um, you know, I could order her to come here, <laughs> but okay. you know, I'd rather see see how she feels about it. Okay, I just feel like I, it was very informative when the DA had their analysts they come have in an a meeting. They an outside vendor that does it. Oh, it was an outside vendor. Okay, Kelly I wasn't Research. aware of that there were two people there, and it was yes. really it helped the people during the meeting. But um, so I will work on that. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Councillor Duran Court. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Good to see you, Chief. Um, with respect to what I'm looking at uh, on this budget, it seems like, you know, we have a lot of vacancies. Uh, people are retired and stuff like that. So with the new guys that, you know, you, you are about to have on your department, uh, is it just refilling those vacant departments or new people adding to the folks that you used to have before? Well, there's a few, <coughs> excuse me, additional positions. Um, so we're gonna be at the full complement of 204. So as we speak, so how many people do you have in your department in terms of like, Police officers. As we speak right now? Yes. We're at, I believe, 187. 187. So, minus, is it add on to this 24, 26 people that are vacant right now or minus into it? Our total, when we're done, will be 204. Is that correct? 204. 206. 206. So, you are adding, you are adding into it? Yes. So, but you also said that after all these men and women gone to the Police Academy, you're still going to have an eight more vacant. So where does that number come from? Oh, it's in the budget. No, what I'm saying is that so regardless what happened with that 200, 
206 people that you're going to add, you're still going to have a deficit of eight more people in terms of like vacancies. Right, there are eight funded positions. We would have filled them all if we could have now. Okay. But the problem is we won't have anyone to train them when they come out. So as we speak, we don't. Is it like you don't but have any? We, we have training offices, but we don't have 24 of them. Okay. Um, so we couldn't put them all together because when they're done the academy, we need, they need to be trained. Okay. Thank you, Chief. And um, we, we got to overtimes. And as you know, I mean, I think one of the questions uh, that I've been asking based on, I think, Council Susan Nikashi Ward for a meeting, and I think um, um, Ward 3 uh, Council uh, Dennis and Ari meeting, so I've been to all of them. And one of the biggest concerns that uh, some of our residents have is the fact that sometimes when they call 911, uh, yeah. according to them, um, it takes a long time for some of our men and women to show up, and I know how busy, you know, certain dates, especially Fridays and Saturdays and Sunday can be in the city. But one of the things that they ask is that they would like to see more police presence on certain, certain street, like West Chestnut Street. And I think there was like a couple of people complaining about people just flying down there, Belmont Street, Pleasant Street. I believe some people mentioned Oak Street. I'm telling based on mm -hmm. uh, some of the call that I got. And we got to traffic. Um, are you planning on increasing some of your guys to actually go out there to making sure that you know people are driving accordingly in terms of uh, you know the request yes. of the population. We've been fortunate enough to get some traffic enforcement grants, so we'll be putting more people out dedicated solely to traffic. Sounds good. Thank you, Chief. And um, here's one of the things that I've been seeing so far, according to my own observations. I've seen a lot of tented cars. Sometimes they are driving; you cannot even see who's driving them. So I'm assuming this is not legal. So do you commend your guys to actually pull those cars over? And we we do, and there's a meter that goes on the window that says okay. what the tint reading is. Because I myself sometimes... Sometimes they look dark and they're legal. Um, okay. Oh, okay. But, you know, they are cited, um, and they have to remove them. So, okay, so if you do find one that sort of like, you know, do it a little bit too much, your guys do have the ability to pull that person over... Yes. ...and give them a ticket. Yes. Okay, that's pretty good. So, um, with that being said, Mr. President, thank you, Chief. I truly appreciate you. what you've been doing for the city. Thank you, Councillor Councillor Castro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Chief Crowley. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And I just want to open by saying I'm so grateful to the Brockton Police, and in particular uh, the, the, the gentlemen who have uh, educated me in the last year and spent extra time and worked on my matters in Ward 4, most especially Captain Picaro, Lieutenant LaGrice, Sergeant Schleiman, Officer Healy spoke at my Ward 4 meeting. Um, I know a lot more as I sit here tonight than I did a year ago when I sat here. And, and thank you very much. And you've also thank spent you. time with me too and been patient. Um, there, there's a lot here um, for 134 police officers and 45 supervisors. This budget sets out $22.1 million, okay, in the next year. Um, plus, um, for overtime, for public safety, license, and just personal services overtime, another 1.7 million. Y you know, we, we take it very seriously, keeping our residents safe throughout the city. It's a lot of money, and, and so I wanted to mention that. I wanted the folks at home to hear those numbers. We exchanged emails. You, you know that I'm concerned about hearing this evening about how we're going to handle the summer. Loud, long parties and fireworks to boot. The summer is always a challenge. Um, fireworks, you know, they're a nuisance around the 4th of July, but every city in town in America pretty much faces the same problem on that day. Mm -hmm. um, it all comes down to staffing. Mm -hmm. um, we, we could add an additional car probably for parties, but one officer isn't going to stop a party. We have to go in there ready to stop the party, so we have to go with enough people to actually do it. Um, we're going to do the best we can with what we have. Um, you know, we'll have additional patrols out for the 4th of July, but then again, it'll be um, impact shifts if we can fill them. Um, we have mandatory uh, overtime on the shifts, forced overtime, we call it. Um, you know, people find out, yeah, you're not going home tonight. You're going to have to stay. And, you know, that, that's, you can only get so much out of everybody. Mm -hmm. 
we're definitely gonna do the best we can for you. I just worry about the guys who get hit with the forced overtime. They're tired on that second shift. Yes. And, and uh, that's usually in the evening when all the mischief happens. And um, I'm just hoping that with a little bit of time now, you're able to s plan to staff up at these times. Um, and the other thing I wanted to speak to you about is when you came in front of us last July, we talked about what they do in Lawrence, where in the summer months and the weekends, they have one patrol car that is devoted to noise calls. Any chance of us doing something like that here? There is, depending on staffing levels. Um, if we have the manpower on, we will definitely do it. Um, but it, it just depends on staffing. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Borgard, did you want to say something? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Chief. Uh, I mean, you're talking about the staffing levels, and we are concerned with the parties with uh, the fireworks, et cetera. I mean, this year, July 4th starts on a Thursday. So I imagine some people will be taking that Friday off and there'll be four straight nights of rowdiness. And uh, I realize that some people want that time off too, and I don't blame them. It's, it's really great out at that time of year, as opposed to some other times where it's just not the, you know, the same uh, weather and, things to do and whatever. I mean, is it best for us to plan to work with the state police and other law enforcement officials because we are lacking um, individuals to be out on the streets? I mean, my biggest frustration is not with the 911 calls. It's with the response we get, what they refer to them in your department as the call takers. And people say, oh, when someone, you know, no one's available, no one's available. I mean, we went through that huge problem with the one real snowstorm we had, which we were very grateful we only had one. And we, people get very frustrated with these responses. And I mean, I believe that, how would I say it, there should be a more of a, um, an appropriate response, certainly for the call takers. And yes, you're in line four, where are you? In the famous line, you're on the board. So I just, you know, believing in that. But maybe, I mean, should we look into some other kind of, how would I say, assistance, put that in quotes, support for this time of the year? I mean, I realize that um, my big thing with the fireworks is not only the noise, but in this case, you know, some of them can set and start fires <coughs> and that, you know, becomes overwhelming and certainly even more dangerous. So. That's, that's what I'm, I'm asking you this evening as we look at your gigantic budget and realize the you know overwhelming challenges that go along with uh, the needs of a city of over 100,000 people. Yes, we will look, um, we always look, but these departments we reach out to also have their same staffing concerns and they also have jobs they have to do. Um, you know, when I, I get it, I understand fireworks are a major concern during the 4th of July, but we have other crimes going on in this city that are priority. Oh, no, I agree, I agree. In a perfect world, we'd have enough of everything and we'd all live happily ever after. Um, <coughs> fortunately, we don't have that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah. Uh, Chief, I just wanted to ask, uh, possibly during the 4th of July weekend, do we get any additional help from the state police, for instance, to help us out with some traffic control? It, we usually, yeah. the sun will come, we'll have the CAT team will come in as they always do, um, and they'll assist us. Because, you know, as you all know, we get busier in the summer. So um, we always ask, and they're always willing. But I mean, specifically for that, that weekend, you know, when we know it's, uh, we've had some issues with, you know, people calls all over the place. I mean, you hear them as loud as any, 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 anybody. Right. Uh, is there any way that you can put an additional call to them and say if they can send out some additional? The problem is they don't have our radios. They have their own radios. Oh, they do. Um, and we don't dispatch to them. Um, <sighs> So when they do come, they're here mostly doing motor vehicle stuff. Okay. Um, their specialized units work like with our gang unit, the narcotics unit works with our narcotics unit. Um, but for just street level patrol, we don't have the communication with them. All right. All right. If there are any more questions, uh, thank you, Chief. Thank you for coming. Good night. Thank you. Number 10, Madam. Conservation Commission, David Zaff, Chairman. Mr. Zaff, how are you? Okay. 
<laughs> Join the party. <laughs> <coughs> My buddy Jay DeBarry, who roots against every Boston team, just informed me that we're down to one. So, <laughs> hoping we can get to the yeah, second and third I've been period. Cheating and kind of cheating. Um, I was elected to the, uh, appointed to the board in 2014, and then elected chairman in 16. I think the board has evolved into be more of a applicant friendly board where we still, our main goal is to protect our wetlands and our Wetlands Protection Act, but we are not as obstructionist as boards in the past. So um, I think we're making good progress and I'm very happy with the way my commission sits today. Um, as far as the budget, it looks like we have an increase of about 700 bucks <laughs> Next. from 4558 to 46.8, which I think is a little less than, I don't know, 2%. Um, I don't know if there are any line items that any of the Kermit, uh, councils would like to review, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, Council Beauregard, I know, I know this is one of your uh, favorite items <laughs> to uh, I see Ann at every meeting. <laughs> Go well, ahead, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for being here. Now, let's, let's remember, it's not being an obstructionist if you're looking at protecting this community. So sure. remember no, that. But there are and boards in the past, and I've been a commercial real estate developer for 33 years, and it took me two years to get a permit in the town of Whitt Middleborough at one time for a conservation permit. Um, we're a city, okay, and we have different rules such as a 25-foot protection versus a 200-foot protection of a riverbank. But we do understand the regulations. I've been doing this pretty much all my life. So um, I'm just saying in the past I've felt that some of the um, board members weren't as willing to work with some of the applicants. Well, I want to commend you for the job you did uh, a couple of weeks ago. Councillor Cruz was there for one item for what? Almost an hour and a half. And I appreciate that you look at um, over things more closely. I know you have a missing board member because you had a young woman on there and she had to step down. Mm -hmm. She was an attorney. I know she had to step down due to family illness. So I'm hoping that uh, we get a new, uh, another person to replace her. But in the meanwhile, I'm just looking at conservation purchase and services. I'm just curious. Um, most of the time, I imagine that's, um, what was I going to say, supplies and informa information. Um, but, but I was just curious, was there anything large that sticks out here? Because, I mean, you're a governing board here, and it just it stuck out. And I was just curious on that and also on the consultant. I know that we're fortunate enough to have a terrific conservation agent in this city. Megan Shave does a marvelous job. Mm -hmm. but And I am aware that we still need consultants. But I was just, if you could well, follow yeah, up on both of those. Basically, Megan does basic review for the CONCOM, uh, she uh, looks at the sites, delineates the wetlands, agrees with the wetlands lines, handles enforcement orders in certain conditions that arise, and she's paid for by the city. Um, our outside consultants, which we use beta, which used to be Nova Armstrong, basically reviews um, larger projects, um, any type of subdivisions of over four or five subdivision lots or industrial retail or office uh, developments. Um, we need stormwater drainage calculations that are an analyzed by a professional engineer. So they kind of handle those type of responsibilities. So, you know, Megan from the local level, she gets out there, she's our eyes. Yes. But Bader is our backup. Thank you, thank you. That's it. <coughs> Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, David. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Have you no further questions? Thank you for your service and thank you for your willingness to uh, serve the city. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Number 11, Madam. Planning, Planning Board. Board, Robert Pelagi, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council President. Welcome, Good sir. Good evening, Councilors. Uh, Bob Pelagi, 
Planning Board and I have prepared a, a brief statement uh, relative to the function of the Planning Board. Uh, the Planning Board is a five-member board uh, meeting monthly that serves the residents of the city by uh, preparing and, approved, and, and approving a master plan for the city, maintaining the official map of the city and the administration and implementation of the subdivision control law as well as those sections of its own rules and regulations rel uh, related to the subdivision of land within the city. The board is the, the uh, board is the permit granting authority for the site plan for site plan review. Now, most recently, to include uh, establishments that will be selling marijuana, and also for forecast smart growth, as well as uh, performing a variety of other critical services. The board is also responsible for preparing and approving uh, district plans like the downtown action strategy. Uh, the Department of Planning and Economic Development staff provides full-time administrative support to the board as well as performing all the day-to-day -day duties in serving the public. And as far as the, the actual budget, the planning board's budget, we have a total budget for the year of 23875 and that is basically broken down into three categories. The first one is planning board um, overtime, basically planning board overtime for administrative staff for the meetings. Uh, second category is planning board uh, purchase and services. You can see the various line items there. And the third category of the budget is uh, planning board goods and, goods and supplies. I'd be happy to take any questions that anybody might have. Uh, thank you, uh, sir, uh, Councillor Ianera. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Pelagi. Nice good to see you. And, um, my, my question to you, um, because I think uh, the Planning Board does a, um, an outstanding job, and I am very concerned. Um, I know um, you've been uh, sitting as the, um, the chairman, and I hope that you're going to continue to remain sitting as the chairman. Um, as the time goes on. Is that uh, something that's going to be happening, I, I would hope? Well, it would, you never know what the future brings. But, <laughs> well, but I'm, just, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just, just concerned because, and, and I'll be right up front, I'm just you know, concerned with uh, uh, another member on that board becoming a chairperson, and I hope that that never happens, to be truthful with you. So I'll, I'll leave names out of it, to be truthful with you. But I'm sorry, the, the what? I said I would leave his name out of it. I'm okay. just concerned. Okay. I would say for the immediate time being, I'll, I'll, I'll You're going to be the chairman. Okay. Yes. I, just, I just want to make sure because I think it needs to be ran by somebody like you and, and your integrity and somebody that's been involved in the city. And you've done a lot of work in the city years ago when, when it was you, your father, your brother, everybody. You know what I mean? So you understand, you know, the, the process. So I think that's very important. Very important. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you. Councilor Borgart, followed by Nicastro. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Pelagi, and thank you for stepping in as the chair this year. That kind of uh, happened pretty uh, quickly and uh, 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 prepared. Uh, first of all, um, I do appreciate all, all you guys do, and uh, you've been very open-minded about a lot, and there certainly have been changes, even in just the past two years, of different issues that come up. My, um, my, I guess, my, my, uh, Question now, I, d I do see um, consultant here. Do you have any idea which consultant they'd be referring to? Is it also beta, like the Conservation Commission? For the Conservation Commission, if the Planning Board has a project where in the, in the city's best interest, we may want to uh, outsource okay. a professional engineer for drainage calculations and the like. So it's a similar, similar expenditure. In okay. a lot, but in a lot of cases, uh, when, it, when a a, a pro, when a, an applicant comes in, they, they're responsible. A lot of times, th they'll pay the peer review. No, I also Depends on who's for whose benefit we're we're, we're hiring. We're, we're, we're requiring the, the peer review. Oh no, thank you, and I appreciate <coughs> how you've been really stringent now about having everybody come prepared. And you're very lucky that uh, you have uh, some good assistant leadership in uh, the office manager of the planning department, as far as that goes, because good, uh, there's been some staff. heated, heated, um, I want to say, interaction at some times. I am um, just uh, want to bring um, to your attention, and I'm sure you've been made aware of this, but um, some of us serve on the traffic commissioner have served and is supposed to be a member of the planning board on the traffic commission and we've been missing um, an individual so we have a, we have an appointed member the yes but um, we not have not seen that individual 
I'm Quite sorry, at, and, 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 and at our meetings, I yes. I wasn't aware of that, because we have. No. no, we have not. Uh, it would be safe to say we did not see him so far um, in this calendar year. Um, but um, if you doubt me, our clerk I, no, no, is not terrific. At all. I, I yeah. know you cover most of the meetings. I'll follow up on that. And okay. See Thank you very a much. Lack of, a lack of attendance there. And because um, contribution is important, and thank you for all you do, we appreciate it. You're welcome. No idea. Thank you, Councilor Councilor Cash. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Palagi. Thanks evening, for being Council. here, and thanks for stepping up to be the chair. You're just fine where you are. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes. I just have a, a very basic question. <laughs> I noticed under on page 183, Planning Board Purchase of Services, legal, $350. Uh, You're I not getting a lot of legal work for that. No. no. So what are you getting? Um, I might need some help with that question. Jesus. Jesus. Oh, it's recording? Oh, recording yes. Recording documents? They I guess it was recording, recording fees? Yeah. yeah. So it's recording fees. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. you are right. In today's economy, so. you're not going to get this is true. a lot of legal services. Oh okay. okay. Well, I noticed on the Conservation <laughs> Commission budget, and I didn't mention it, they had food for $100. We don't, we don't get food. You should get food. You should think about that. <laughs> right. Right. Food. That's right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, nothing else? No questions? Thank you, sir, for all that you do. It's, uh, it's volunteers like you that make our city much, Thank much better. Thank you. Sir. Certainly. Appreciate it. He's a class act. Number 12. Okay. Traffic Commission, Captain John Hallisey. Monsieur Capitaine, Traffic Council Traffic President, Council Look. My name is John Hallisey, Captain John Hallisey, the Brockton Police Department. I've been a police officer for 33 years. Oh, this is uh, my mission statement. The Traffic Commission's responsibilities include enforcement and regulations of the rules, regulations and ordinance which pertain to vehicle street traffic and parking, the adoption amendment or repeal of said regulations is needed. Yeah, yeah. Traffic yeah, commissioner is also responsible for line painting in the city, traffic signs, repair of the traffic control signals, maintenance and placement of school zone lights, placement of barriers, and payment of police details used during the course of the street painting. The traffic commission may restrict parking on certain streets within the city when public safety and convenience warrant it, and may issue residence parking permits for restricted parking when needed. The Traffic Commission is also responsible for the advertising and printing of all parking regulations and resident parking permits. Captain, uh, any questions? Well, first of all, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Captain, for being here. Let's, let's remember that the person that does uh, the whole organizing and everything is uh, the clerk back there, and um, mm -hmm. she has incredible follow-through, and we're very grateful for that. No, as, as you just heard me mention to our planning board um, chair, that um, we seem to be lacking a member or representative from the planning board, and I know that you wrote a letter. Well, and, Mary. Yes, and you received a response from the mayor's office that they were looking into it. Is that correct? Yes. So That's that, uh, okay, so uh, we have that, that on record. And um, I myself am a strong proponent of hopefully seeing a traffic division because uh, we have an awful lot of streets and we have an awful lot of requests for concerns with traffic. Yes, what do. I do want to say is in um, the past year since we've been here, we're fortunate enough now for people to be able to go online and request should they want a stop sign or a crosswalk or what have you and begin the process and then we can go and attend the meeting as, uh, and uh, represent the constituent, or how would I say, advocate for the constituent. So I really like that policy. And again, I cannot emphasize en enough that we're very excited that you have these grants for traffic, because we know that we want people to be following the speed limit, which uh, my counselor colleague here can attest to that was a very stringent request at her last ward meeting. And of course, mine the previous month was on the illegal parking. So we know that that falls under traffic and we're grateful for the, the as much as you can do and, and more so too. Thank you. God almighty. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, you know, Captain Hallisey, I just wanna say you know publicly that um, I would like to you know to thank you for 
uh, what you've been doing for the city for the past uh, 32 years. Uh, you and I, you uh, ever much. since I've been, um, you know, elected officials, we have a very decent relationship. Whenever I call you up on something, uh, you always make sure that, you know, that request is, is satisfied. But it's so uh, excellent to know that you've been serving the city of Brockton way before I was born. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> If I knew that's what you were going to say, I wasn't going to let you speak. <laughs> but <laughs> Council Lally. Uh, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, given the amount of money that the Traffic Commission receives and given the amount of work involved, uh, I think that, you know, the Commission does a very, a very good job um, even before. I, I served on it this year, but before that, uh, you know, going to a lot of meetings, they do, uh, they do a lot of good work. And, uh, you know, this, this is the, the first year I've, I've served on the commission, but I have to say, of all the traffic commissioners I've served with, you have been the best. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, mm -hmm. Council. Council Nakesh. Thank you. Good evening, Captain Hallisey. Glad to see you're still awake. Yeah. Fine. I think some of us are really starting to wilt. But anyway, this is my question. On page 215 under traffic commission goods and supplies, there's an item, traffic lines. And is that for painting the lines on the street? Exactly what it's for. I bet our residents don't know that it costs, well, if this budget is approved, $418,729. Up from last year, $369,927. I'm sorry, Line painting is big business, and we have hundreds of miles of roads in Brockton. Yeah, it's... 300? We have 300 miles of roads? Well, I don't know exactly the, the miles. I know it's a lot. Okay. So it takes us 28 days just to paint the lines. Then we have right. to do the arrows, then the long lines. It's about 32, 34 days. Wow, that's big bucks. And a job well done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, anything else for the captain? Captain, you must go back to patrol. All right. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> Number 13, madam. Veteran Services, David A. Farrell, Director. Mr. Farrell, welcome. <laughs> thank you, uh, Mr. President. Thank you. Um, I apologize. Mike I is yours. <laughs> thank you. I apologize. I didn't bring a formal statement, but uh, it can be summarized. The Veteran Service uh, Office and is charged with the responsibility of uh, taking care of the uh, Brockton residents who are veterans and uh, making sure they're connected with all the uh, benefits and services that uh, they're entitled to under federal and state law, as well as uh, laws that have been adopted by the city of Brockton. And uh, with that, I would open it up to any questions you might have about uh, this year's budget. I believe I have Councillor Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Farrell. Good evening, Councillor. Um, thank you for everything that you do to help the vets here in the city of Brockton. And I don't have a question about the budget per se. It's, it's about the ordinance that we passed we, a couple of years ago, the Veterans Work Off Program. Um, is, is any current vet utilizing that? Or oh, yes, anything? yes. We, we have a couple who use it every year. Um, you know, I, know I would say it average. It's between two or three. Oh, that's great, that's David. Nice. I didn't know that. Yes. Oh, question. that's great. Yeah. That's great. Question? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, uh, Council Sullivan. You, you, Matt, That's great. Yes. Council Borgard, do you, you have a question? Thank you, thank you Mr. Chair. Thank you, um, David, for being here. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you for that book you put together that um, recognizes all the memorials in, in the communities and monuments, et cetera. I mean, my, um, I guess really my question was, I knew that you had um, someone step out on maternity leave, we're glad that she's back and we're happy that that's going okay. And I know that you had hired someone. We had the pleasure of meeting at the holiday parade and I just wanna make sure is, is this the veteran service investigator? Yes, that's correct. Uh, Cecile Gomes was hired to uh, replace uh, the retirement, uh, the retiring of Jack O'Connor. Okay, thank you. And she, I mean, I met her just for a second, uh, briefly. And am I to understand that this one works in um, collaboration with the VA hospital? Is this the position that? No, that oh. that's uh, funded through other services. Um, um, that position is held by Steve Abrams. Yeah. Okay, so he's, he's not he's in my budget, uh, but okay, I mean, he he's not included here on the personnel services. to be part yes. of the liaison. Okay, yes. thank you very much. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Councillor 
Uh, Councilor Cruz. Thank you. David, thank you for the job you do. Great job last thank week you. at Memorial Day. Thank you. Um, just something I'd like to point out to the people at home. So your biggest line item is $725,000 veterans cash. And it's actually benefits that are paid mm -hmm. directly to veterans returning and in, in trouble. And Yes, uh, it, it, it goes to fund uh, uh, direct financial aid to uh, indigent veterans who are below 100% of the federal poverty level and live in the city of Brockton. And most of that is reimbursed by the state. And 75% of it, that's correct, is uh, reimbursed uh, by the state of Massachusetts. So the rest just comes out of our budget. So yes. But 75% of that is reimbursed. So I just, I've had uh, people before in the past say to me that that's quite a bit of money. Of course, it's not. But uh, the fact that it's reimbursed at 75% is important for the public to know. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Cruz. Uh, anyone else? Please stay there because you've got the next item. Thank number you. Number 14, please. Veterans Council, David A. Farrell, Director. Thank you. Um, You're back on, sir. So the Veterans Council essentially is the uh, entity responsible for uh, putting together the parades on Memorial Day and uh, um, Veterans Day as well. Any questions with regards to that? No. Hearing none. Thank you, sir, for your service and Thank you, your support President. of our city. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, look at this. We're almost done. Um, okay. Number 15, please. <laughs> Animal control. Thomas DeCellis, supervisor. Welcome, sir. Good evening, uh, Mr. President, counselors. Good evening. I'll start with my mission statement. Please do. The uh, Animal Control Department's primary mission is to protect the safety of the public and animals ensure compliance with city, state, and federal laws governing animals, educate and promote responsible pet ownership, provide temporary housing and care of stray animals, reunite missing pets with owners, and rehoming unclaimed animals. And with that, I'll take any questions you might have on the budget. Does anybody have any questions in regards to the budget, Madam Counselor? Good evening. Good evening. Um, quick question. I, do you work in collaboration with the um, animal officer at the Board of Health, or is it? The animal inspector? Yes. Yes, we inspector. work in close relationship. So how has that affected you having that pos position be being empty for so long? Uh, right now, well, we've unfortunately dealt with this off and on for a few years now. Um, right now, uh, Lou Tataglia, the executive director, he's taken on those responsibilities. So anything from an animal inspector issue that comes up, we forward it over to him. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Councillor Borgard. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank oh, you for counselor. being here, and um, you know you do a, do a super job here. I'm really. We, we had a little episode a couple of weeks ago, and your you know your team came out, and I guess I just want you to go over that. That um, evidently there was someone with a dead animal that did not belong to them on their property, and you mentioned that animal control can come and remove it at a cost. And I just wanted you to mention that this evening, yeah. Yes, right now uh, under the ordinances, and actually while I was sitting here in the uh, chamber, um, I had told you we're in the process of updating the animal control ordinances. I got a, uh, an email from Megan Bridges that there's a final draft ready uh, or should be ready by the end of the week. And what we're gonna de deal with is uh, right now under the current ordinance, as far as, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm dealing with um, a cold and uh, allergies, so please bear with me. Um, under the current ordinance when it comes to deceased animals, we will respond out for a fee and remove an owner's pet that has passed away, uh, but there's nothing else as far as guidelines for removing deceased animals off private property. Uh, we are responsible for picking up the dead animals in the roadway. Under the new ordinances that we're looking to propose, we're looking to also include removal of deceased animals from private property for a fee. Okay. So that will hopefully, you know, go before the ordinance committee in the near future. I know, I think this is good with, you know, how I say people that are afraid just in case the animal dies, died of the yeah. disease. And also we have, you know, an elderly population that we need to consider. But I just, I now, if there's a fee, which I imagine there will be, and I realize sometimes that's for testing and, and what have you, how do they pay for it? 
Um, actually, if I could just back up for a quick sec, I neglected to mention one thing too. If it's a if it's a potential rabies situation, we will respond out for those cases and remove those animals. Um, as far as payment goes, you can pay cash uh, the exact amount or check or money order. Oh, really? Okay. All right. Thank you very much, and thank you for all you you and your team does. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Councillor. Councillor Yenier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I noticed um, you, you uh, have a new van. We actually have two of them courtesy to uh, City Council, and uh, they're working out spl splendidly. Uh, I thought for a while there we were going to be walking to calls. <laughs> <laughs> Not so that, well, it, it's, it's good to see, but the only thing that I notice is the, um, the lettering that's on it, it seems to be on the small side. Yes, um, I'm probably going to enlarge that uh, at some point. Uh, uh, we actually just were trying something new, some new designs. Okay. So that was more or less just put on there temporarily. All right, so um, it, it will change and be yes. much larger. Yeah, you, you'll yeah. see larger lettering put on I, there. I'd, I'd rather see it. I mean, why not? Publicity is publicity, so I would I would like to see that. Okay. Um, I, I also noticed um, what, we spend, what, uh, about 1800 plus for, for dog food and... Um, <laughs> Is that Perina or uh, what type are we using today? What are we, um, <laughs> we don't have a <laughs> we don't have a specific brand okay. um, because we don't know the animals' diets when they come in. So, uh, but we actually, thankfully, we get a lot of donations. So we have been fortunate that we've been able to move that money that not spent on uh, pet supplies because okay. it's not just dog food. There's cats we pick up on occasion, or you've probably seen if you monitor our Facebook page, you'll see we've had a lot of chickens and roosters and rabbits and other assorted animals coming in recently. So that other co that covers the cost of those types of foods right. as well. Okay. That, that answers my question. You can tell it's five past 10 and I'm usually sound asleep by now, but that's okay. Thank you, appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Anything else? Thank you all for right. all that you do for the city. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. We are now at our last item for this evening. Human Number resource. 16. Human Resources, Sandra Knight, Director. Ms. Knight, welcome. Good evening and thank you, Council budget, President. Your first, your first budget meeting. I'm sorry? It's your first budget meeting. This is my first budget meeting, exactly. Welcome. So I just uh, crossed the six month threshold for you. All right. So I just got a mission statement for you to open it up Please with do. and good evening, counselors. Good evening. Um, it's the mission of the Human Resources Department to provide effective human resource management by developing and implement implementing policies, programs, and services that contribute to the attainment of the city's goals and to provide our employees a stable work environment with equal opportunity for learning and personal growth. This is best achieved by continuously researching, learning, developing, and delivering innovative result-oriented services, policies, and systems for, for and with staff, applicants, and external stakeholders. We also provide solutions in an efficient and customer-focused model and strive to enhance the employment experience and satisfaction of all staff through clear communication, outreach, engagement, and support. So I'd like to open it up. Councillor Monaghan. Followed by Farwell. Good evening, Councillor. Great. Um, <clears throat> are you going to be coming? Uh, well, the mayor come, going to be coming back for us for an assistant director. I know you need. Uh, you do need that position. It's unfunded at this time. But are you going to be? Are, are you going to need one this, this coming year? I'm going to need help. Yes, I am in desperate need of um, an assistant director right now. Yeah, for what we want to see the human resources grow and develop into cannot be um, attained by one person. Was there a reason that it wasn't funded this right now at this time? Any, any idea what the mayor was thinking on that? Why, why it wasn't funded? I have no idea what, <laughs> what was left off of that. Troy, do you have an idea? So uh, I believe the positions right now are in the ordinance committee awaiting yes. action uh, by the ordinance committee. Yes. So yes. for fiscal year 2020, both the assistant director and the admin assistant are fully funded in this budget. Okay, 
just said it in here, just in this right here, it says unfunded. Tell them to put the microphone. No, but the salaries are there, yeah, so. Put your salary salary on. Positions on. Oh, you know what? You're right. That is that. Okay. Counselor, yeah, you're correct. It does say unfunded. It says unfunded, but, yes. But then it says new position, so it is sort of confusing. Uh, but if you look to the right, it does provide the, the, full, the full funding for okay. the positions in the budget. All right, good. Thank you. Thank you very much. You bet. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Powell. Yes. Uh, actually, Mr. Clarkson, I think I'll, I'll uh, spare Ms. Knight this one because she's relatively new. Uh, three positions are going to be paid from the Health Insurance Trust. Mm -hmm. I can tell you I don't agree with that. We've never done that before, and there is absolutely no way that those three people are spending 100 percent of their time on health insurance benefits issues. Um, and you and I know under the uniform Massachusetts accounting system, if you have a trust fund, you've got a fiduciary responsibility to pay out of that trust fund for expenses that are directly related to health costs, health Point benefits. of information? Uh, counselor. Uh, counselor, I can tell you because obviously I was in, they are strictly working on health trust issues. They were never able to work on other issues, which was one of the problems that this office has had for when it was a personnel department for 20 years, is those people in that office were not allowed to work on other issues because they are paid out of that fund. Well, I looked at last year's FY19 budget, and if you check that, you will not find that, that uh, three people were paid out of the trust fund. I actually, I believe it was two. Uh, two. You, you uh, surely was, and, and one other person was partially paid out of the trust fund, but there is no way that those three people are spending 100 percent, 35 hours per week on health insurance trust fund issues, and if that's true, then we should be able to find out the statistics on how many benefits changes there are, how many new employees there are. It, that, it's just, you, you just can't do it. And but I can tell you that t two of those people were paid out of that, and it, it handcuffed that office completely to do other issues. Well, well, through you to the chair, I'm not quite sure whether you're arguing that you should pay them and have them do I'm devoted not saying completely should to. I'm just saying that was the case in the past. I know that to be the case. Well, I, I will research who was paid from what fund uh, overnight and come back at that. But I would just say to Mr. Clarkson, unless, unless these three individuals are performing 100 percent of their time, 35 hours per week on those issues, then I would respectfully say that we're not supposed to pay them out of that trust fund. That trust fund is made up of our local appropriation and the monies that are paid in by employees and retirees, and I think they have a right to expect that we would expend those funds appropriately. So I'll gladly do some research as I can tomorrow and send an email to you and, and we can go from there. But, uh, uh, and I actually had an email today from, from either one or two individuals that particularly asked me to look into this. So, so I'm happy to answer the, the question. Uh, I, I'm well aware of the requirements uh, of the trust fund and uh, this funding strategy for fiscal year 2020 was a deliberate action uh, because uh, w we sat down with Sandra and based on the direction of the Human Resource Office, as it will be, hopefully, when the new positions are approved, we fully expect that those positions will be wholly dedicated to benefits administration. So, so, so I, it was, so I, I most certainly agree with the assessment counselor that you're making, uh, but saying that we do believe that funding them in this fashion is, is appropriate. Well, obviously you do because you submitted it, but you've got Cook and Company, which assists you with mm -hmm. monitoring all of your revenues and your expenditures. You've got Blue Cross that administers at least one of the, the, the health plans. And, and, and I'm just, if, if you can justify to me that Shirley Rothwell, Nicole Caceres, and Michaela McPhee are going to do absolutely nothing but benefits enrollments, benefits changes, then you know what? I'll take a look at it. I'll, I'll keep an open mind. But and I do know we do the school com the uh, school department work. If mm -hmm. we're so overburdened with school department health benefits issues, mm -hmm. then we should be back charging them. 
we should have something come over to the city side for that. But, uh, you know, I saw that, and, uh, I, and, and again, I, I'm not saying that Councillor Cruz is wrong. I will go back and recheck my research, but I do not believe we'll find that two full-time employees were paid out of the trust fund, but I could be wrong. Uh, so that's, now I'd like to just go back to Ms. Knight. Um, there's no doubt that you could use an assistant director of human resources, and when you were hired, that was one of the discussions. But when we have positions that are open, who interviews? Who interviews people for either internal or external uh, the positions? Department. The department is responsible. But who? Who interviews them? Yeah. Do you, do you interview? No, I do not. You don't? No, I do not. So you don't participate in any interviews whatsoever? No, I do not, okay. unless who? requested by that person. Okay. So who does in your office? Participate in the interviews? Yeah. I do. You just said you didn't. No, no. Oh, Only when department. requested. Okay, let me rephrase this. We have an external candidate for a position. Yep. Okay. The department head obviously is going to be involved. Right. Okay, if, if you're not requested, then no one goes from HR? No. Okay. Inter an internal candidate, a union posting, and you have two or three candidates, mm -hmm. obviously the department head would be involved. So unless the department head requests... The department head is the sole interviewer? Yes. Okay. This is peculiar. Have any of the personnel in your office, other than yourself, participated in interviews of candidates? Mm. Since I've been there? Yes. It could have been one. And that was to hire a temporary person in our office. So of all of the personnel in your office, no one has ever participated in any other interviews except for a position in your office? Not since I've been there. No. Not since you've been there. Okay. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Sullivan. Thank you. Good evening, Ms. Knight. Just, just evening, to kind of piggyback with Mr. Farwell, uh, just to make sure I'm clear on that. So. Unless you're requested, you yourself, as HR director, don't get involved in the actual face-to-face -face interview of a prospective employee. Correct. Who, who came up with that policy? It's not a policy. When I first started, we implemented hiring guidelines. Those hiring guidelines... Who, who implemented them, though? I did. You did? Yes, I did. Shared them with each department head and followed up with the department heads on them. Okay. It's not a policy written that but it's a guideline. Now they're guidelines. Hiring guidelines established to help department heads or whomever in the interview process. Okay. Um, relative to two items that are referenced here, um, one is consultant, 30,000. You requested the mayor came back 34,500. I'm just trying to get mm -hmm. clarification what that would be. It's on page 147, human resource purchase services consultant. Yeah. I know for some um, items that we have coming up are the salary surveys um, for that, and that would be the McCormick's, whether well, the uh, Collin Center, excuse me. And um, if we are to implement an applicant tracking system, I would need a consultant to help out with the implementation on that okay. as well. Okay. And then the last one was on the overtime. It's three grand requested three grand recommended who, who in your office would qualify for overtime and what would be the specific purpose well I think right now if we're short staffed or um, for their um, responsibilities I believe it's um, open enrollment and also in September I think there's a big um, when the school's back in session for the school side from what I am aware of uh, Mr. Claxton I know this probably isn't because Mr. Condon was here <laughs> for many years, but is that, mm -hmm. I mean, if I look at back in 08, it was zero. So do you know, I mean, three grand based on a $450 million budget is not a lot, but I, I you know, I wanna know exactly what it is. <coughs> does, that, does that sound accurate in past practices <laughs> because of open enrollment, you have to pay an overtime? 
It certainly doesn't sound unreasonable to me. It, it existed in the budget, so when, when I reviewed the budget, frankly, it, it remained in there. Um, I haven't familiarized myself to the letter with all of the collective bargaining agreements, but the requirement uh, in an administrative collective bargaining agreement to, to work that extra time, uh, one of the remedies for that certainly is overtime. They're not union members. They're not union members. They're not any unions. None of your employees. Yeah, all three are in the bargaining. Yeah, they go to Procter Nine and stuff. No other questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Borgard, followed by Duran McClurk. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you for uh, being out this evening. And um, mine is a little bit with the budget and this talk about a policy handbook and a procedures handbook. Um, that you know, when you become an employee of the city, and I believe that, um, not that you've had the time to breathe, but <laughs> that there was a discussion about launching something like that at some point and, and defining the various positions. I mean, I've, we've noticed some change, and I think that's for the better. Matter of fact, I'll take that back. I know it's for the better, but uh, I was just following, it, asking on that um, you know, uh, aspect. Are you, are you speaking of in terms of an employee handbook? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Um, I don't have the staff right now to develop anything in terms of uh, an employee handbook. But that is it's a on. Oh, it's definitely on the radar. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you, Councilor. Thank, thank, you, Council. 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 thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Ms. Knight, uh, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to come here. So I'm going to ask you just one question in regard mm -hmm. to what um, I believe um, Council Sullivan stated. Um, we got to that assistant person you are looking for. And I believe last year, I myself made a statement in regard to the importance of having somebody <coughs> working with you in regard to some conversation that I had prior to you with Mo and Chris. So would you, would you, would, would you, would you accept that, that position should at least has your review in regard to who is coming to your department as opposed to you have no knowledge whatsoever? I'm sorry, can you repeat that Just question? ask you the question a different way. So when it's come to hiring that new person, mm -hmm. would you admit that you must be able to actually participate in that hiring process in regard to that new person, your assistant coming to that board? Absolutely. If it's someone I'm going to hire in my department that's going to report so, to me directly. So as you speak, according to your statement, do you know whether or not if we do, you know, come up with that money or whatever, do you, do you know or probably have some ideas on whether or not you will be requested by whomever will ask you to be part of that interview process? Are you, okay, are you saying that, okay, let me just try to the question phrase that I'm the question, you, the I'm question that I'm asking you is really that, asking. the question that I'm asking you is that I believe Council Farrell asked you in regard to hiring. Yeah. So we know that you do need an assistant, and yes. I'm assuming most of us believe in that. Mm -hmm. So what somewhat shocked me, it seems like you may not even have any knowledge in terms of like hiring that person when it's come down to your department according to what you stated right now. Because it took you some time to, to think about like, okay, at least one time, someone in your department was part of the hiring process. Was that statement true? Oh, are you, are, oh, okay. And yet to, to your answer, mm -hmm. I will have in a direct contact in the interview process so on that, that. So that will be a must? That would happen. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, President. I, I think what, uh, what she was referring to is the other hiring for other departments, not not her. Not in own my department. own department. Yeah, if that's her own what you mean. She's going to interview the person working for her department. What what she was referring to right. is not being involved in the hiring process for other departments unless requested. Okay, so because that that's that's the issue that I that I had in regard to what you were saying because I was like, okay, if you are looking for an assistant, mm -hmm. uh, I would assume it would be your responsibility to be part of that hiring Agreed. process. So yes. if you weren't even involved, I could have told you right now I'd vote against it because I oh. would believe that yeah. this is a position that does require your knowledge in regard to who you are dealing with, not only that, and the money that we are paying for that person according mm -hmm. to our taxpayers. But yes. given the fact that you said that you will be part of that hiring process, that satisfies my need. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. You're welcome. <laughs> I was defending you. Well, you made a real nice defense, yeah. buddy. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anything else for uh, Miss Knight? Uh, hearing none, 
Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Council President. Uh, that concludes our night one. <laughs> night one. Huh? And ladies, thank you very much for being here. Councilors, uh, just a quick reminder that we'll be back here tomorrow at 6.30 sharp. 6.30 sharp. Hearing no further business, we are adjourned.